Mahabharata, Book 2, Section 41. Sasupala said that mighty King Jarasandha, who desired not to fight with Krishna, saying he is a slave, was worthy of my greatest esteem. Who will regard as praiseworthy the act which was done by Kesva, as also by Bhima and Arjuna, in the matter of Jarasandha's death? Entering by an improper gate, disguised as a Brahmana, thus Krishna observed the strength of King Jarasandha. And when that monarch offered it first unto this rich water to wash his feet, it was then that he denied his Brahmanahood from seeming motives of virtue. And when Jarasandha, O thou of the Kuru race, asked Krishna and Bhima and Dhananjaya to eat, it was this Krishna that refused that monarch's request. If this one is the Lord of the universe, as this fool representeth him to be, why doth he not regard himself as a Brahmana? This, however, surpriseth me greatly that though thou leadest the Pandavas away from the path of the wise, they yet regard thee as honest. Or, perhaps, this is scarcely a matter of surprise in respect of those that have thee, O Bharata, womanish in disposition and bent down with age, for their counselor in everything. Vaisampayana continued, hearing these words of Susupala, harsh both in import and sound, that foremost of mighty men, Bhimasena, endued with energy, became angry. And his eyes, naturally large and expanding and like unto lotus leaves, became still more extended and red as copper under the influence of that rage. And the assembled monarchs beheld on his forehead three lines of wrinkles like the Ganga of Trouble Currents on the Trouble Peak Mountain. When Bhimasena began to grind his teeth in rage, the monarchs beheld his face resembling that of death himself, at the end of the yuga, prepared to swallow every creature. And as the hero endued with great energy of mind was about to leap up impetuously, the mighty-armed Bhishma caught him like Mahadeva seizing Mahasena, the celestial generalissimo. And, O Bharata, Bhima's wrath was soon appeased by Bhishma, the grandsire of the Kurus, with various kinds of counsel. And Bhima, that chastiser of foes, could not disobey Bhishma's words, like the ocean that never transgresseth, even when swollen with the waters of the rainy season, its continents. But, O king, even though Bhima was angry, the brave Susupala, depending on his own manhood, did not tremble in fear. And though Bhima was leaping up impetuously every moment, Susupala bestowed not a single thought on him, like a lion that wrecks not a little animal in rage. The powerful king of Chedi, beholding Bhima of terrible prowess in such rage, laughingly said, Release him, O Bhishma. Let all the monarchs behold him scorched by my prowess like an insect in fire. Hearing these words of the ruler of the Chedis, Bhishma, that foremost of the Kurus and chief of all intelligent men, spoke unto Bhima these words. Mahabharata, Book 2, Section 42 Bhishma said, This Susupala was born in the line of the king of Chedi with three eyes and four hands. As soon as he was born, he screamed and brayed like an ass. On that account, his father and mother, along with their relatives, were struck with fear. And beholding these extraordinary omens, his parents resolved to abandon him. But an incorporeal voice, about this time, said unto the king and his wife with their ministers and priests, all with hearts paralyzed by anxiety, those words, This thy son, O king, that hath been born will become both fortunate and superior in strength. Therefore thou hast no fear from him. Indeed cherish the child without anxiety. He will not die in childhood. His time is not yet come. He that will slay him with weapons hath also been born. Hearing these words, the mother, rendered anxious by affection for her son, addressed the invisible being and said, I bow with joined hands unto him that hath uttered these words respecting my son, whether he be an exalted divinity or any other being, let him tell me another word, I desire to hear who will be the slayer of this my son. The invisible being then said, He upon whose lap this child being placed the superfluous arms of his will fall down upon the ground like a pair of five-headed snakes, and at the sight of whom his third eye on the forehead will disappear, will be his slayer. Hearing of the child's three eyes and four arms, as also of the words of the invisible being, all the kings of the earth went to Chedi to behold him. The king of Chedi worshipping, as each deserved, the monarchs that came, gave his child upon their laps one after another. And though the child was placed upon the laps of a thousand kings, one after another, yet that which the incorporeal voice had said came not to pass. 
And having heard of all this at Dwaravati, the mighty Yadava heroes Sankarshana and Janadana also went to the capital of the Chaitis to see their father's sister, that daughter of the Yadavas, the queen of Chaiti, and saluting everybody according to his rank in the king and queen also, and inquiring after everybody's welfare, both Rama and Kesva took their seats. And after those heroes had been worshipped, the queen with great pleasure herself placed the child on the lap of Damodra. As soon as the child was placed on his lap, those superfluous arms of his fell down and the eye on his forehead also disappeared. And beholding this, the queen in alarm and anxiety begged of Krishna a boon. And she said, O mighty armed Krishna, I am afflicted with fear, grant me a boon. Thou art the assurer of all afflicted ones and that the dispeller of everybody's fear. Thus addressed by her, Krishna, that son of the Itarase, said fear not, O respected one. Thou art acquainted with morality. Thou needest have no fear from me. What boon shall I give thee? What shall I do, O Ant? Whether able or not, I shall do thy bidding. Thus spoken to by Krishna, the queen said, O thou of great strength, thou wilt have to pardon the offenses of Susupala for my sake. O tiger of the Yeta race. No, O Lord, even this is the boon that I ask. Krishna then said, O Ant, even when he will deserve to be slain, I will pardon an hundred offenses of his. Grieve thou not. Bhishma continued, Even thus, O Bhima, is this wretch of a king Susupala of wicked heart, who, proud of the boon granted by Govinda, summons thee to battle. Mahabharata, Book 2, Section 43 Bhishma said, The will under which the ruler of Chedi summoneth thee to fight though thou art of strength that knoweth no deterioration, is scarcely his own intention. Assuredly, this is the purpose of Krishna himself, the lord of the universe. O Bhima, what king is there on earth that would dare abuse me thus, as this wretch of his race, already possessed by death, hath done today? This mighty armed one is, without doubt, a portion of Hari's energy. And surely, the Lord desireth to take back unto himself that energy of his own. In consequence of this, O tiger of the Kuru race, this tiger-like king of Chedi, so wicked of heart, roareth in such a way caring little for us all. Vaisampayana continued, Hearing these words of Bhishma, the king of Chedi could bear no more. He then replied in rage unto Bhishma in these words, Let our foes, O Bhishma, be endued with that prowess which this Kesva hath, whom thou like a professional chanter of hymns praisest, rising repeatedly from thy seat. If thy mind, O Bhishma, delighteth so in praising others, then praise thou these kings, leaving off Krishna. Praise thou this excellent of kings, Dharada, the ruler of Valhika, who rent this earth as soon as he was born. Praise thou, O Bhishma, this Karna, the ruler of the territories of Anga and Vanga, who is equal in strength unto him of a thousand eyes, who draweth a large bow, who endued with mighty arms owneth celestial earrings of heavenly make with which he was born, and this coat of mail possessing the splendor of the rising sun, who vanquished in a wrestling encounter the invincible Jarasanda equal unto Vasva himself, and who tore and mangled that monarch. O Bhishma, praise Drona and Aswathaman, who both father and son are mighty warriors, worthy of praise, and the best of Brahmanas, and either of whom, O Bhishma, if enraged, could annihilate this earth with its mobile and immobile creatures, as I believe. I do not behold, O Bhishma, the king that is equal in battle unto Drona or Aswathaman. Why wishest thou not to praise them? Passing over Duryodhana, that mighty armed king of kings, who was unequaled in whole earth girt with her seas, and King Jayadratha accomplished in weapons, and endued with great prowess, and Druma the preceptor of the Kemperushas, and celebrated over the world for prowess, and Saradwada's son, old Kripa, the preceptor of the Bharata princes, and endued with great energy, why dost thou praise Kesva? Passing over that foremost of bowmen, that excellent of kings, Rugman of great energy, why praisest thou Kesva? Passing over Bhishmaka of abundant energy, and King Dantavakra, and Bhagadatta known for his innumerable sacrificial stakes, and Jayatsena the king of the Magadha, and Virata and Drupada, and Sakuni and Vrihadvala, and Vinda and Anyavinda of Avant Pandya, Sweta Uttamasankhya of great prosperity, the proud Vrishasena, the powerful Eklavya, and the great charioteer Kalinga of abundant energy. Why dost thou praise Kesva? And, O Bhishma, if thy mind is always inclined to sing the praises of others, why dost thou not praise Salia and other rulers of the earth? 
O king, what can be done by me when, it seemeth, thou hast not heard anything before from virtuous old men giving lessons in morality? Hast thou never heard, O Bhishma, that reproach and glorification, both of self and others, are not practices of those that are respectable? There is no one that approveth thy conduct, O Bhishma, and unceasingly praising with devotion, from ignorance alone, Kesva so unworthy of praise. How dost thou, from thy wish alone, establish the whole universe in the servitor and cowherd of Boja, Kansa? Perhaps, O Bharata, this thy inclination is not conformable to thy true nature, like to what may be in the bird Bulinga, as hath already been said by me. There is a bird called Bulinga living on the other side of the Himavet. O Bhishma, that bird ever uttereth words of adverse import. Never do anything rash, this is what she always saith but never understandeth that she herself always acteth very rashly. Possessed of little intelligence that bird picketh from the lion's mouth the pieces of flesh sticking between the teeth, and at a time when the lion is employed in eating. Assuredly, O Bhishma, that bird liveth at the pleasure of the lion. O sinful wretch, thou always speakest like that bird. And assuredly, O Bhishma, thou art alive at the pleasure only of these kings. Employed in acts contrary to the opinions of all, there is none else like thee. Vaisampayana continued, hearing these harsh words of the ruler of Chedi, Bhishma, O king, said in the hearing of the king of Chedi, Truly am I alive at the pleasure of these rulers of earth. But I do regard these kings as not equal to even a straw. As soon as these words were spoken by Bhishma, the kings became inflamed with wrath. And the down of some amongst them stood erect, and some began to reprove Bhishma. And hearing those words of Bhishma, some amongst them, that were wielders of large bows, exclaimed, This wretched Bhishma, though old, is exceedingly boastful. He deserveth not our pardon. Therefore, ye kings, incensed with rage as this Bhishma is, it is well that this wretch were slain like an animal, or, mustering together, let us burn him in a fire of grass or straw. Hearing these words of the monarchs, Bhishma the grandsire of the Kurus, endued with great intelligence, addressing those lords of earth, said, I do not see the end of our speeches, for words may be answered with words. Therefore, ye lords of earth, listen ye all unto what I say. Whether I be slain like an animal or burnt in a fire of grass and straw, thus do I distinctly place my foot on the heads of ye all. Here is Govinda, that knoweth no deterioration. Him have we worshipped. Let him who wisheth for speedy death summon to battle Madhava of dark hue and the wielder of the discus and the mace, and falling enter into and mingle with the body of this god. Mahabharata, Book 2, Section 44 Vaisampayana said, Hearing these words of Bhishma, the ruler of Chedi endued with exceeding prowess, desirous of combating with Vasudeva, addressed him and said, O Janadana, I challenge thee. Come, fight with me until I slay thee today with all the Pandavas. For, O Krishna, the sons of Pandu also, who disregarding the claims of all these kings, have worshipped thee who art no king, deserve to be slain by me along with thee. Even this is my opinion, O Krishna, that they who from childishness have worshipped thee, as if thou deservest it, although thou art unworthy of worship, being only a slave and a wretch and no king, deserve to be slain by me. Having said this, that tiger among kings stood there roaring in anger. And after Sasupala had ceased, Krishna addressing all the kings in the presence of the Pandavas, spoke these words in a soft voice, Ye kings, this wicked-minded one, who is the son of a daughter of the Satwata race, is a great enemy of us of the Satwata race, and though we never seek to injure him, he ever seeketh our evil. This wretch of cruel deeds, ye kings, hearing that we had gone to the city of Pragjyatisha, came and burnt Dvarka, although he is the son of my father's sister. While King Boja was sporting on the Rivataka hill, this one fell upon the attendants of that king and slew, and led away many of them in chains to his own city. Sinful in all his purpose, this wretch, in order to obstruct the sacrifice of my father, stole the sacrificial horse of the horse sacrifice that had been let loose under the guard of armed men. Prompted by sinful motives, this one ravished the reluctant wife of the innocent Vabru, Akura, on her way from Dvarka to the country of the Salviras. This injurer of his maternal uncle, disguising himself in the attire of the king of Karusha, ravished also the innocent Bhadra, the princess of Visala, the intended bride of king Karusha. 
I have patiently borne all these sorrows for the sake of my father's sister. It is, however, very fortunate that all this hath occurred today in the presence of all the kings. Behold ye all today the hostility this one beareth towards me. And know ye also all that he hath done me at my back. For the excess of that pride in which he hath indulged in the presence of all these monarchs, he deserveth to be slain by me. I am ill able to pardon today the injuries that he hath done me. Desirous of speedy death, this fool had desired Rukmini. But the fool obtained her not, like a sudra failing to obtain the audition of the Vedas. Vaisampayana continued, hearing these words of Vasudeva, all the assembled monarchs began to reprove the ruler of Chedi. But the powerful Sasupala, having heard these words, laughed aloud and spoke thus, O Krishna, art thou not ashamed in saying in this assembly, especially before all these kings that Rukmini, thy wife, had been coveted by me? O slayer of Madhu, who else is there than thee, who regarding himself a man would say in the midst of respectable men that his wife had been intended for somebody else? O Krishna, pardon me if thou pleasest, or pardon me not. But angry or friendly, what canst thou do unto me? And while Susupala was speaking thus, the exalted slayer of Madhu thought in his mind of the discus that humbleth the pride of the Azuras. And as soon as the discus came into his hands, skilled in speech the illustrious one loudly uttered these words, Listen ye lords of earth, why this one had hitherto been pardoned by me. As asked by his mother, a hundred offenses of his were to be pardoned by me. Even this was the boon she had asked, and even this I granted her. That number, ye kings, hath become full. I shall now slay him in your presence, ye monarchs. Having said this, the chief of the Edus, that slayer of all foes, in anger, instantly cut off the head of the ruler of Chedi by means of his discus. And the mighty armed one fell down like a cliff struck with thunder. And, O monarch, the assembled kings then beheld a fierce energy, like unto the sun in the sky, issue out of the body of the king of Chedi, and O king, that energy then adored Krishna, possessed of eyes like lotus leaves, and worshipped by all the worlds, and entered his body. And all the kings beholding the energy which entered that mighty armed chief of men regarded it as wonderful. And when Krishna had slain the king of Chedi, the sky, though cloudless, poured showers of rain, and blasting thunders were hurled, and the earth itself began to tremble. There were some among the kings who spoke not a word during those unspeakable moments, but merely sat gazing at Janadana. And some there were that rubbed and raged their palms with their forefingers. And there were others who, deprived of reason by rage, bit their lips with their teeth. And some amongst the kings applauded him of the Vrishni race in private. And some there were that became excited with anger, while others became mediators. The great Rishis with pleased hearts praised Kesva and went away. And all the high-souled Brahmanas and the mighty kings that were there, beholding Krishna's prowess, became glad at heart and praised him. Yudhisthira then commanded his brothers to perform without delay the funeral rites of King Sasupala, the brave son of Damagosha, with proper respect. The sons of Pandu obeyed the behest of their brother. And Yudhisthira then, with all the kings, installed the son of King Sasupala in the sovereignty of the Chaitis. Then that sacrifice, O monarch, of the king of the Kurus possessed of great energy, blessed with every kind of prosperity, became exceedingly handsome and pleasing unto all young men and commenced auspiciously, and all impediments removed, and furnished with abundance of wealth and corn, as also with plenty of rice and every kind of food, it was properly watched by Kesva. And Yudhisthira in due time completed the great sacrifice. And the mighty armed Janadana, the exalted Sari, with his bow called Saranga and his discus and mace, guarded that sacrifice till its completion. And all the Kshatriya monarchs, having approached the virtuous Yudhisthira, who had bathed after the conclusion of the sacrifice, said these words, By good fortune thou hast come out successful. O virtuous one, thou hast obtained the imperial dignity. O thou of the Ajamata race, by thee hath been spread the fame of thy whole race. And, O king of kings, by this act of thine, thou hast also acquired great religious merit. We have been worshipped by thee to the full extent of our desires. We now tell thee that we are desirous of returning to our own kingdoms. It behoveth thee to grant us permission. Hearing these words of the monarchs, 
King Eudistira the Just, worshipping each as he deserved, commanded his brothers, saying, These monarchs had all come to us at their own pleasure. These chastisers of foes are now desirous of returning to their own kingdoms, bidding me farewell. Blessed be ye, follow ye these excellent kings to the confines of our own dominions. Hearing these words of their brother, the virtuous Pandava princes followed the kings, one after another as each deserved. The powerful Drishtadiumna followed without loss of time King Virata, and Dhananjaya followed the illustrious and mighty charioteer Yajnasena, and the mighty Bhimasena followed Bhishma and Dhritarashtra, and Sadeva, that master of battle, followed the brave Drona and his son, and Nakula, O king, followed Suvalo with his son. And the sons of Drupadi with the son of Subhadra followed those mighty warriors the kings of the mountainous countries. And other bulls among Kshetriyas followed other Kshetriyas. And the Brahmanas by thousands also went away, duly worshipped. After all the kings and the Brahmanas had gone away, the powerful Vasudeva addressing Yudhishthira said, O son of the Kuru race, with thy leave, I also desire to go to Dvarka. By great good fortune, thou hast accomplished the foremost of sacrifices, Rajasuya. Thus addressed by Janadana, Yudhishthira replied, Owing to thy grace, O Govinda, I have accomplished the great sacrifice. And it is owing to thy grace that the whole Kshetriya world, having accepted my sway, had come hither with valuable tribute. O hero, without thee, my heart never feeleth any delight. How can I, therefore, O hero, give thee, O sinless one, leave to go? But thou must have to go to the city of Dvarka. The virtuous Hari of worldwide fame, thus addressed by Yudhishthira, cheerfully went with his cousin to Pritha and said, O aunt, thy sons have now obtained the imperial dignity. They have obtained vast wealth and been also crowned with success. Be pleased with all this. Commanded by thee, O aunt, I desire to go to Dvarka. After this, Kesva bade farewell to Drupathi and Subhadra. Coming out then of the inner apartments accompanied by Yudhishthira, he performed his ablutions and went through the daily rites of worship and then made the Brahmanas utter benedictions. Then the mighty armed Daruka came there with a car of excellent design and body resembling the clouds. And beholding that Garuda Banat car arrived thither, the high souled one, with eyes like lotus leaves, walked round it respectfully and ascending on it set out for Dwaravati. And King Yudhishthira the Just, blessed with prosperity, accompanied by his brothers, followed on foot the mighty Vasudeva. Then Hari with eyes like lotus leaves, stopping that best of cars for a moment, addressing Yudhishthira the son of Kunti, said, O king of kings, cherishest thou thy subjects with ceaseless vigilance and patience. And as the clouds are unto all creatures, as the large tree of spreading bough is unto birds, as he of a thousand eyes is unto the immortals, be thou the refuge and support of thy relatives. And Krishna and Yudhishthira having thus talked unto each other took each other's leave and returned to their respective homes. And, O king, after the chief of the Satwata race had gone to Dwaravati, King Duryodhana alone, with King Suvala's son, Sakuni, these bulls among men, continued to live in that celestial assembly house. Mahabharata, Book 2, Section 45 Dayuda Parva Vaisampayana said, when that foremost of sacrifices, the Rajasuya so difficult of accomplishment, was completed, Vyasa, surrounded by his disciples, presented himself before Yudhisthira. And Yudhisthira, upon beholding him, quickly rose from his seat, surrounded by his brothers, and worshipped the Rishi who was his grandfather, with water to wash his feet and the offer of a seat. The illustrious one, having taken his seat on a costly carpet inlaid with gold, addressed King Yudhisthira the jest and said, Take thy seat. And after the king had taken his seat surrounded by his brothers, the illustrious Vyasa, truthful in speech, said, O son of Kunti, thou growest from good fortune. Thou hast obtained imperial sway so difficult of acquisition. And O perpetuator of the Kuru race, all the Kauravas have prospered in consequence of thee. O emperor, I have been duly worshipped. I desire now to go with thy leave. King Yudhisthira the Just, thus addressed by the Rishi of Dark Hue, saluted him, his grandfather, and touching his feet said, O chief of men, a doubt difficult of being dispelled hath risen within me. O bull among regenerate ones, save thee there is none to remove it. 
The illustrious Rishi Narada said that, as a consequence of the Rajasuya sacrifice, three kinds of portents, viz, celestial, atmospherical, and terrestrial ones happen. O oh, grandsire, have those portents been ended by the fall of the kind of the Chaitis? Vaisampayana continued, hearing these words of the king, the exalted son of Parasra, the island-born Vyasa of Dark Hue, spoke these words, for thirteen years, O king, those portents will bear mighty consequences ending in destruction, O king of kings, of all the Kshetriyas. In course of time, O bull of the Bharata race, making thee the sole cause, the assembled Kshetriyas of the world will be destroyed, O Bharata, for the sins of Duryodhana and through the might of Bhima and Arjuna. In thy dream, O king of kings, thou wilt behold towards the end of this might the blue-throated Bhava, the slayer of Tripura, ever absorbed in meditation, having the bull for his mark, drinking off the human skull, and fierce and terrible, that lord of all creatures, that god of gods, the husband of Uma, otherwise called Hara and Sarva, and Vrisha, armed with the trident and the bow called Panaka, and attired in tiger skin. And thou wilt behold Shiva, tall and white as the Kailasa cliff and seated on his bull, gazing unceasingly towards the direction, south, presided over by the king of the Pitris. Even this will be the dream thou wilt dream today, O king of kings. Do not grieve for dreaming such a dream. None can rise superior to the influence of time. Blessed be thou. I will now proceed towards the Kailasa mountain. Rule thou the earth with vigilance and steadiness, patiently bearing every privation. Vaisampayana continued, having said this, the illustrious and island-born Vyasa of Dark Hue, accompanied by his disciples ever following the dictates of the Vedas, proceeded towards Kailasa. And after the grandfather had thus gone away, the king afflicted with anxiety and grief, began to think continuously upon what the Rishi hath said. And he said to himself, Indeed what the Rishi hath said must come to pass. We will succeed in warding off the fates by exertion alone? Then Yudhishthira, endued with great energy addressing all his brothers, said, Ye tigers among men, ye have heard what the island-born Rishi hath told me. Having heard the words of the Rishi, I have arrived at this firm resolution viz, that I should die, as I am ordained to be the cause of the destruction of all Kshatriyas. Ye, my dear ones, if time hath intended, so what need is there for me to live? Hearing these words of the king, Arjuna replied, O king, yield not thyself to this terrible depression that is destructive of reason. Mustering fortitude, O great king, do what would be beneficial. Yudhishthira then, firm in truth, thinking all the while of Dwepayana's words, answered his brothers thus, Blessed be ye. Listen to my vow from this day. For thirteen years, whatever purpose have I to live for, I shall not speak a hard word to my brothers or to any of the kings of the earth. Living under the command of my relatives, I shall practice virtue, exemplifying my vow. If I live in this way, making no distinction between my own children and others, there will be no disagreement between me and others. It is disagreement that is the cause of war in the world. Keeping war at a distance, and ever doing what is agreeable to others, evil reputation will not be mine in the world, ye bulls among men. Hearing these words of their eldest brother, the Pandavas, always engaged in doing what was agreeable to him, approved of them. And Yudhishthira the jest, having pledged so, along with his brothers in the midst of that assembly, gratified his priests as also the gods with due ceremonies. And, O bull of the Bharata race, after all the monarchs had gone away, Yudhishthira, along with his brothers, having performed the usual auspicious rites, accompanied by his ministers, entered his own palace. And, O ruler of men, King Duryodhana and Sukuni, the son of Suvala, continued to dwell in that delightful assembly house. Mahabharata, Book 2, Section 46 Vaisampayana said that bull among men, Duryodhana, continued to dwell in that assembly house of the Pandavas. And with Sukuni, the Kuru prince slowly examined the whole of that mansion, and the Kuru prince beheld in it many celestial designs, which he had never seen before in the city called after the elephant Hastinapur. And one day King Duryodhana, in going round that mansion, came upon a crystal surface. And the king, from ignorance, mistaking it for a pool of water, drew up his clothes. And afterwards finding out his mistake, the king wandered about the mansion in great sorrow. 
and sometime after, the king, mistaking a lake of crystal water adorned with lotuses of crystal petals for land, fell into it with all his clothes on. Beholding Duryodhana fallen into the lake, the mighty Bhima laughed aloud as also the menials of the palace. And the servants, at the command of the king, soon brought him dry and handsome clothes. Beholding the plight of Duryodhana, the mighty Bhima and Arjuna, and both the twins all laughed aloud. Being unused to putting up with insults, Duryodhana could not bear that laugh of theirs. Concealing his emotions, he even did not cast his looks on them. And beholding the monarch once more draw up his clothes to cross a piece of dry land which he had mistaken for water, they all laughed again. And the king sometime after mistook a closed door made of crystal as open. And as he was about to pass through it, his head struck against it, and he stood with his brain reeling. And mistaking as closed another door made of crystal that was really open, the king in attempting to open it with stretched hands, tumbled down. And coming upon another door that was really open, the king thinking it is closed, went away from it. And, O monarch, King Duryodhana now beholding that vast wealth in the Rajasuya sacrifice and having become the victim of those numerous errors within the assembly house at last returned, with the leave of the Pandavas, to Hastinapur. And the heart of King Duryodhana, afflicted at sight of the prosperity of the Pandavas, became inclined to sin, as he proceeded towards his city reflecting on all he had seen and suffered. And beholding the Pandavas happy, and all the kings of the earth paying homage to them, as also everybody, young and old, engaged in doing good unto them, and reflecting also on the splendor and prosperity of the illustrious sons of Pandu, Duryodhana, the son of Dhritarashtra, became pale. In proceeding to his city, with an afflicted heart, the prince thought of nothing else but that assembly house and that unrivaled prosperity of the wise Yudhishthira. And Duryodhana, the son of Dhritarashtra, was so taken up with his thoughts then that he spoke not a word to Suvala's son even though the latter addressed him repeatedly. And Sukuni, beholding him absent-minded, said, O Duryodhana, why art thou proceeding thus? Duryodhana replied, O uncle, beholding this whole earth owning the sway of Yudhishthira in consequence of the might of the illustrious Arjuna's weapons, and beholding also that sacrifice of the son of Pritha like unto the sacrifice of Sakra himself of great glory among the celestials, I, being filled with jealousy and burning day and night, am being dried up like a shallow tank in the summer season. Behold, when Sasupala was slain by the chief of the Satwadas, there was no man to take the side of Sasupala. Consumed by the fire of the Pandava, they all forgave that offense, otherwise who is there that could forgive it? That highly improper act of grave consequence done by Vasudeva succeeded in consequence of the power of the illustrious son of Pandu. And so many monarchs also brought with them various kinds of wealth for King Yudhishthira, the son of Kunti, like tribute-paying Vaishas. Beholding Yudhishthira's prosperity of such splendor, my heart burneth, afflicted with jealously, although it behoveth me not to be jealous. Having reflected in this way, Duryodhana, as if burnt by fire, addressed the king of Gandhara again and said, I shall throw myself upon a flaming fire, or swallow poison, or drown myself in water. I cannot live. What man is there in the world possessed of vigor who can bear to see his foes in the enjoyment of prosperity and himself in destitution? Therefore I who bear to see that accession of prosperity and fortune in my foes am neither a woman nor one that is not a woman, neither also a man nor one that is not a man. Beholding their sovereignty over the world and vast affluence, as also that sacrifice, who is there like me that would not smart under all that? Alone I am incapable of acquiring such royal prosperity, nor do I behold allies that could help me in the matter. It is for this that I am thinking of self-destruction. Beholding the great and serene prosperity of the son of Kunti, I regard fate as supreme and exertions fruitless. O son of Suvala, formerly I strove to compass his destruction. But baffling all my efforts he hath grown in prosperity even like the lotus from within a pool of water. It is for this that I regard fate as supreme and exertions fruitless. Behold, the sons of Dhritarashtra are decaying and the sons of Pritha are growing day by day. Beholding that prosperity of the Pandavas and that assembly house of theirs and those menials laughing at me, my heart burneth as if it were on fire. Therefore, O uncle, know me now as deeply grieved and filled with jealousy and speak of it to Dhritarashtra. 
Mahabharata, Book 2, Section 47 Sakuni said, O Duryodhana, thou shouldst not be jealous of Yudhishthira. The sons of Pandu are enjoying what they deserve in consequence of their own good fortune. O slayer of foes, O great king, thou couldst not destroy them by repeatedly devising numberless plans, many of which thou hadst even put to practice. Those tigers among men out of sheer luck escaped all those machinations. They have obtained Drupadi for wife and Drupada with his sons, as also Vasudeva of great prowess as allies, capable of helping them in subjugating the whole world. And O king, having inherited the paternal share of the kingdom without being deprived of it, they have grown in consequence of their own energy. What is there to make thee sorry for this? Having gratified Hastasana, the Nanjaya hath obtained the Bao Gandiva and the couple of inexhaustible quivers and many celestial weapons. With that unique bow, and by the strength of his own arms, also he hath brought all the kings of the world under his sway. What is there to make thee sorry for this? Having saved the Azuramaya from a conflagration, Arjuna, that slayer of foes, using both his hands with equal skill, caused him to build that assembly house. And it is for this also that commanded by Maya, those grim Rakshasas called Kinkara supported that assembly house. What is there in this to make thee sorry? Thou hast said, O king, that thou art without allies. This, O Bharata, is not true. These thy brothers are obedient to thee. Drona of great prowess and wielding the large bow along with his son, Radha son Karna, the great warrior Gautama, Kripa, myself with my brothers and King Samadadi, these are thy allies. Uniting thyself with these, conquer thou the whole of the earth. Duryodhana said, O king, with thee, as also with these great warriors, I shall subjugate the Pandavas, if it pleases thee. If I can now subjugate them, the world will be mine and all the monarchs, and that assembly house so full of wealth. Sakuni replied, The Nanjaya and Vasudeva, Bhimasena and Yudhishthira, Nakula and Sadeva and Drupada with his sons, these cannot be vanquished in battle by even the celestials, for they are all great warriors wielding the largest bows, accomplished in weapons, and delighting in battle. But, O king, I know the means by which Yudhishthira himself may be vanquished. Listen to me and adopt it. Duryodhana said, Without danger to our friends and other illustrious men, O uncle, tell me if there is any way by which I may vanquish him. Sakuni said, The son of Kunti is very fond of dice play, although he doth not know how to play. That king, if asked to play, is ill able to refuse. I am skillful at dice. There is none equal to me in this respect on earth, no, not even in the three worlds, O son of Kuru. Therefore, ask him to play at dice. Skilled at dice, I will win his kingdom, and that splendid prosperity of his for thee, O bull among men. But, O Duryodhana, represent all this unto the king, Dhritarashtra. Commanded by thy father, I will win without doubt the whole of Yudhishthira's possessions. Duryodhana said, O son of Suvala, thou thyself represent properly all this to Dhritarashtra, the chief of the Kurus. I shall not be able to do so. Mahabharata, Book 2, Section 48 Vaisampayana said, O king, impressed with the great Rajasuya sacrifice of King Yudhishthira, Sakuni, the son of Suvala, having learned before the intentions of Duryodhana, while accompanying him in the way from the assembly house, and desirous of saying what was agreeable to him, approached Dhritarashtra endued with great wisdom, and finding the monarch deprived of his eye seated, in his throne, told him these words, No. O great king, O bull of the Bharata race, that Duryodhana, having lost color, hath become pale and emaciated and depressed and a prey to anxiety. Why dost thou not, after due inquiry, ascertain the grief that is in the heart of thy eldest son, the grief that is caused by the foe? Dhritarashtra said, Duryodhana, what is the reason of thy great affliction? O son of the Kuru race, if it is fit for me to hear it, then tell me the reason. This Sakuni here says that thou hast lost color, become pale and emaciated, and a prey to anxiety. I do not know what can be the reason of the sorrow. This vast wealth of mine is at thy control. Thy brothers and all our relations never do anything that is disagreeable to thee. Thou wearest the best apparel and eatest the best food that is prepared with meat. The best of horse carries thee. 
what it is, therefore, that hath made thee pale and emaciated. Costly beds, beautiful damsels, mansions decked with excellent furniture, and sport of the delightful kind, without doubt these all wait but at thy command, as in the case of the gods themselves therefore, O proud one, why dost thou grieve, O son, as if thou wert destitute? Duryodhana said, I eat and dress myself like a wretch and pass my time all the while a prey to fierce jealousy. He indeed is a man, who incapable of bearing the pride of the foe, liveth having vanquished that foe with the desire of liberating his own subjects from the tyranny of the foe. Contentment, as also pride, O Bharata, are destructive of prosperity, and those other two qualities also, viz, compassion and fear. One who acteth under the influence of these, never obtaineth anything high. Having beheld Eudistyrus prosperity, whatever I enjoy brings me no gratification. The prosperity of Kunti's son that is possessed of such splendor mocketh me pale. Knowing the affluence of the foe and my own destitution, even though that affluence is not before me, I yet see it before me. Therefore, have I lost color and become melancholy, pale and emaciated. Eudistyra supporteth eighty-eight thousand Snataka Brahmanas leading domestic lives, giving unto each of them thirty slave girls. Beside this, thousand other Brahmanas daily eat at his palace the best of food on golden plates. The king of Cambodia sent unto him, as tribute, innumerable skins, black, darkish, and red, of the deer cuddly, as also numberless blankets of excellent textures and hundreds and thousands and thousands of she-elephants and thirty thousand she-camels wander within the palace, for the kings of the earth brought them all as tribute to the capital of the Pandavas. And, O Lord of earth, the kings also brought unto this foremost of sacrifices heaps upon heaps of jewels and gems for the son of Kunti. Never before did I see or hear of such enormous wealth as was brought unto the sacrifice of the intelligent sons of Pandu. And, O king, beholding that enormous collection of wealth belonging to the foe, I cannot enjoy peace of mind. Hundreds of Brahmanas, supported by the grants that Yudhisthira hath given them and possessing wealth of kind, waited at the palace gate with three thousands of millions of tribute, but were prevented by the keepers from entering the mansion. Bringing with them clarified butter and handsome commandalus made of gold, they did not obtain admission into the palace, and Ocean himself brought unto him in vessels of white copper the nectar that is generated within his waters, and which is much superior to that which flowers and annual plants produce for Sakra. And Vasudeva, at the conclusion of the sacrifice, having brought an excellent comp, bathed the son of Pritha with sea water brought in thousand jars of gold, all well adorned with numerous gems. Beholding all this I became feverish with jealousy. Those jars had been taken to the eastern and the southern oceans. And they had also been taken on the shoulders of men to the western ocean, O bull among men. And, O father, although none but birds only can go to the northern region Arjuna, having gone thither, exacted as tribute a vast quantity of wealth. There is another wonderful incident also which I will relate to thee. O listen to me. When a hundred thousand Brahmanas were fed, it had been arranged that to notify this act every day conches would be blown in a chorus. But, O Bharata, I continually heard conches blown there almost repeatedly. And hearing those notes my hair stood on end. And, O great king, that palatial compound, filled with innumerable monarchs that came there as spectators, looked exceedingly handsome like the cloudless firmament with stars. And, O king of men, the monarchs came into that sacrifice of the wise son of Pandu, bringing with them every kind of wealth. And the kings that came there became like vices the distributors of food unto the Brahmanas that were fed. And, O king, the prosperity that I beheld of Yudhisthira was such that neither the chief himself of the celestials, nor Yama or Varana, nor the lord of the Guhyakas owneth the same. And beholding the great prosperity of the son of Pandu, my heart burneth, and I cannot enjoy peace. Hearing these words of Duryodhana, Sakuni replied, Hear how thou mayest obtain this unrivaled prosperity that thou beholdest in the son of Pandu, O thou that hast truth for thy prowess. O Bharata, I am an adept at dice, superior to all in the world. I can ascertain the success or otherwise of every throw, and when to stake and when not. I have special knowledge of the game. The son of Kunti also is fond of dice playing, though he possesseth little skill in it. 
summoned to play or battle, he is sure to come forward, and I will defeat him repeatedly at every throw by practicing deception. I promise to win all that wealth of his, and thou, O Duryodhana, shalt then enjoy the same. Vaisampayana continued, King Duryodhana, thus addressed by Sakuni, without allowing a moment to elapse, said unto Dhritarashtra, This, Sakuni, an adept at dice, is ready to win at dice, O king, the wealth of the sons of Pandu. It behoveth thee to grant him permission to do so. Dhritarashtra replied, I always follow the counsels of Kshata, my minister possessed of great wisdom. Having consulted with him, I will inform thee what my judgment is in respect of this affair. Endued with great foresight, he will, keeping morality before his eyes, tell us what is good and what is proper for both parties, and what should be done in this matter. Duryodhana said, If thou consultest with Kshata, he will make thee desist. And if thou desist, O king, I will certainly kill myself. And when I am dead, O king, thou wilt become happy with Vidura. Thou wilt then enjoy the whole earth, what need hast thou with me? Vaisampayana continued, Dhritarashtra, hearing these words of affliction uttered by Duryodhana from mixed feeling, himself ready to what Duryodhana had dictated, commanded his servant, saying, Let artificers be employed to erect without delay a delightful and handsome and spacious palace with an hundred doors and a thousand columns. And having brought carpenters and joiners, set ye jewels and precious stones all over the walls. And making it handsome and easy of access, report to me when everything is complete. And, O monarch, King Dhritarashtra having made this resolution for the pacification of Duryodhana, sent messengers unto Vidura for summoning him. For without taking counsel with Vidura never did the monarch form any resolution. But as regards the matter at hand, the king, although he knew the evils of gambling, was yet attracted towards it. The intelligent Vidura, however, as soon as he heard of it, knew that the arrival of Kali was at hand. And seeing that the way to destruction was about to open, he quickly came to Dhritarashtra. And Vidura, approaching his illustrious eldest brother and bowing down unto his feet, said these words, O exalted king, I do not approve of this resolution that thou hast formed. It behave thee, O king, to act in such a way that no dispute may arise between thy children on account of this gambling match. Dhritarashtra replied, O Kshata, if the gods be merciful unto us, assuredly no dispute will ever arise amongst my sons. Therefore, auspicious or otherwise, beneficial or otherwise, let this friendly challenge at dice proceed. Even this without doubt is what fate hath ordained for us. And, O son of the Bharata race, when I am near, and Drona and Bhishma and thou too, nothing evil that even fate might have ordained is likely to happen. Therefore, go thou on a car yoking their two horses endued with the speed of the wind, so that thou mayest reach Kandavaprastha even today and bring thy Yudhisthira with thee. And, O Vidura, I tell that even this is my resolution. Tell me nothing. I regard fate as supreme which bringeth all this. Hearing these words of Dhritarashtra and concluding that his race was doomed, Vidura in great sorrow went unto Bhishma with great wisdom. Mahabharata, Book 2, Section 49 Janamajaya said, O thou foremost of all conversant with the Vedas, how did that game at dice take place, fraught with such evil to the cousins, and through which my grandsires, the son of Pandu, were plunged into such sorrow? What kings also were present in that assembly, and who amongst them approved of the gambling match, and who amongst them forbade it? O sinless one, O chief of regenerate ones, I desire thee to recite in detail all about this, which, indeed, was the cause of the destruction of the world. Santi said, thus addressed by the king, the disciple of Vyasa, endued with great energy and conversant with the entire Vedas, narrated everything that had happened. Vaisampayana said, O best of the Bharatas, O great king, if thou desirest to hear, then listen to me as I narrate to thee everything again in detail. Ascertaining the opinion of Vidura, Dhritarashtra the son of Amvika, calling Duryodhana told him again in private O son of Gandhari, have nothing to do with dice. Vidura doth not speak well of it. Possessed of great wisdom, he will never give me advice that is not for my good. I also regard what Vidura saith as exceedingly beneficial for me. Do that, O son, for I regard it all as for thy good also. 
Indeed, the Dura knoweth, with all its mysteries, the science of political morality, that the illustrious and learned and wise Rahaspati, the celestial Rishi, who is the spiritual guide of Vasva, had unfolded unto the wise chief of the immortals. And, O son, I always accept what Vidura adviseth. O king, as the wise Adhava is ever regarded amongst the Vrishnis, so is Vidura possessed of great intelligence, esteemed as the foremost of the Kurus. Therefore, O son, have nothing to do with dice. It is evident that dice soweth dissensions, and dissensions are the ruin of the kingdom. Therefore, O son, abandon this idea of gambling. O son, thou hast obtained from us what, it hath been ordained, a father and a mother should give unto their son, viz, ancestral rank and possessions. Thou art educated and clever in every branch of knowledge, and hast been brought up with affection in thy paternal dwelling. Born the eldest among all thy brothers, living within thy own kingdom, why regardest thou thyself as unhappy? O thou of mighty arms, thou obtainest food and attire of the very best kind, and which is not obtainable by ordinary men. Why dost thou grieve yet? O son, O mighty armed one, ruling thy large ancestral kingdom, swelling with people and wealth, thou shinest as splendidly as the chief of the celestials in heaven. Thou art possessed of wisdom. It behoveth thee to tell me what can be the root of this grief that hath made thee so melancholy. Duryodhana now replied, I am a sinful wretch, O king, because I eat and dress beholding the prosperity of the foes. It hath been said that man is a wretch who is not filled with jealousy at the sight of his enemy's prosperity. O exalted one, this kind of prosperity of mine doth not gratify me. Beholding that blazing prosperity of the son of Kunti, I am very much pained. I tell thee strong must be my vitality, inasmuch as I am living even at the sight of the whole earth owning the sway of Yudhishthira. The Nipas, the Chitrakas, the Kukaras, the Karaskaras, and the Lahajangas are living in the palace of Yudhishthira of like bondsmen. The Himavat, the ocean, the regions on the seashore, and the numberless other regions that yield jewels and gems have all acknowledged superiority of the mansion of Yudhishthira in respect of wealth at Kantaneth. And, O monarch, regarding me as the eldest and entitled to respect, Yudhishthira, having received me respectfully, appointed me in receiving the jewels and gems that were brought as tribute. O Bharata, the limit and the like of the excellent and invaluable jewels that were brought there have not been seen. And, O king, my hands were fatigued in receiving that wealth. And when I was tired, they that brought those valuable articles from distant regions used to wait till I was able to resume my labor. Bringing jewels from the Lake Vindu, the Azura architect Maya constructed, for the Pandavas, a lake-like surface made of crystal. Beholding the artificial lotuses with which it was filled, I mistook it, O king, for water. And seeing me draw up my clothes, while about to cross it, Vrakotara, Bhima, laughed at me, regarding me as wanting in jewels and having lost my head at the sight of the affluence of my enemy. If I had the ability, I would, O king, without the loss of a moment, slay Vrakotara for that. But, O monarch, if we endeavor to slay Bhima now, without doubt, ours will be the fate of Sisupala. O Bharata, that insult by the foe burneth me. Once again, O king, Beholding a similar lake that is really full of water, but which I mistook for a crystal surface, I fell into it. At that, Bhima with Arjuna once more laughed derisively, and Drupathi also accompanied by other females joined in the laughter. That paineth my heart exceedingly. My apparel having been wet, the menials at the command of the king gave me other clothes. That also is my great sorrow. And O king, hear now of another mistake that I speak of. In attempting to pass through what is exactly of the shape of a door, but through which there was really no passage, I struck my forehead against stone and injured myself. The twins Nakula and Sadeva beholding from a distance that I was so hit at the head came and supported me in their arms, expressing great concern for me. And Sadeva repeatedly told me, as if with a smile, this O king is the door. Go this way. And Bhimasena, laughing aloud, addressed me and said, O son of Dhritarashtra, this is the door. And, O king, I had not even heard of the names of those gems that I saw in that mansion. And it is for these reasons that my heart so acketh. Mahabharata, Book 2, Section 50 Duryodhana said, Listen now, O Bharata, 
about all the most costly articles I saw, belonging unto the sons of Pandu, and brought one after another by the kings of the earth. Beholding that wealth of the foe, I lost my reason and scarcely knew myself. And, O Barada, listen as I describe that wealth consisting of both manufactures and the produce of the land. The king of Cambodia gave innumerable skins of the best king, and blankets made of wool, of the soft fur of rodents and other burrowers, and of the hair of cats, all inlaid with threads of gold. And he also gave three hundred horses of the Tetedi and the Kalmasha species possessing noses like parrots. And he also gave three hundred camels and an equal number of she-asses, all fattened with the olives and the pollutia. And innumerable brahmanas engaged in rearing cattle and occupied in low offices for the gratification of the illustrious king Yudhishthira that just waited at the gate with three hundred millions of tribute, but they were denied admission into the palace. And hundred upon hundreds of brahmanas possessing wealth of kind and living upon the lands that Yudhishthira had given them came there with their handsome golden commandalus filled with clarified butter. And though they had brought such tribute, they were refused admission into the palace. And the Sudra kings that dwelt in the regions on the seacoast brought with them, O king, hundred thousands of serving girls of the Carpasica country, all of beautiful features and slender waist and luxuriant hair and decked in golden ornaments, and also many skins of the rank of deer worthy even of Brahmanas as tribute unto King Yudhishthira. And the tribes Viramas, Paradas, Tungas, with the Katavas who lived upon crops that depended on water from the sky or of the river, and also they who were born in regions on the seashore, in woodlands, or countries on the other side of the ocean waited at the gate, being refused permission to enter, with goats and kine and asses and camels and vegetable, honey and blankets and jewels and gems of various kinds. And that great warrior king Bagadatta, the brave ruler of Pragjyatasha and the mighty sovereign of the Mleches, at the head of a large number of Yevnas, waited at the gate unable to enter, with a considerable tribute comprising of horses of the best breed and possessing the speed of the wind. And King Bagadatta, beholding the concourse, had to go away from the gate, making over a number of swords with handles made of the purest ivory and well adorned with diamonds and every kind of gems. And many tribes coming from different regions, of whom some possessed two eyes, some three, and some had eyes on their foreheads, and those also called Ashmikas, and Nishadas, and Romakas, some cannibals, and many possessing only one leg. I say, O king, standing at the gate, being refused permission to enter. And these diverse rulers brought as tribute ten thousand asses of diverse hues, and black necks, and huge bodies, and great speed, and much docility, and celebrated all over the world. And these asses were all of goodly size and delightful color. And they were all bred on the coast of Vanku. And there were many kings that gave unto Yudhishthira much gold and silver. And having given much tribute, they obtained admission into the palace of Yudhishthira. The people that came there possessing only one leg gave unto Yudhishthira many wild horses, some of which were as red as the cochineal, and some white, and some possessing the hues of the rainbow, and some looking like evening clouds, and some that were of variegated color. And they were all endued with the speed of the mind. And they also gave unto the king enough gold of superior quality. I also saw numberless chins and sakas and udras and many barbarous tribes living in the woods, and many Vrishnis and Harahonas, and dusky tribes of the Himavet, and many Nipas and people residing in regions on the sea coast, waiting at the gate being refused permission to enter. And the people of Valhika gave unto him as tribute ten thousand asses, of goodly size and black necks and daily running two hundred miles, and those asses were of many shapes. And they were well trained and celebrated all over the world. And possessed of symmetrical proportion and excellent color, their skins were pleasant to the touch. And the Valhikas also presented numerous blankets of woolen texture manufactured in chin, and numerous skins of the rank of deer, and clothes manufactured from jute, and others woven with the threads spun by insects. And they also gave thousands of other clothes not made of cotton, possessing the color of the lotus. And these were all of smooth texture. And they also gave soft sheepskins by thousands. And they also gave many sharp and long swords and scimitars and hatchets and fine-edged battle axes manufactured in the western countries. And having presented perfumes and jewels and gems of various kinds by thousands as tribute, they waited at the gate, being refused admission into the palace. 
and the Sakas and Takatas and Takaras and Kankas and Ramakas and men with horns bringing with them as tribute numerous large elephants and ten thousand horses, and hundreds and hundreds of millions of gold waited at the gate, being refused permission to enter. And the kings of the eastern countries having presented numerous valuable articles including many costly carpets and vehicles and beds, and armors of diverse hues decked with jewels and gold and ivory, and weapons of various kinds, and cars of various shapes and handsome make and adorned with gold, with well-trained horses trimmed with tiger skins, and rich and variegated blankets for caparisoning elephants and various kinds of jewels and gems, arrows long and short and various other kinds of weapons, obtained permission to enter the sacrificial palace of the illustrious Pandava. Mahabharata, Book 2, Section 51 Duryodhana said, O sinless one, listen to me as I describe that large mass of wealth consisting of various kinds of tribute presented unto Yudhisthira by the kings of the earth. They that dwell by the side of the river Selota flowing between the mountains of Mare and Mandara and enjoy the delicious shade of topes of the Kachaka bamboo, viz, the Kashas, Ekasanas, the Arhas, the Prataras, the Dergavanas, the Paratas, the Kalindas, the Tanganas, and the other Tanganas, brought as tribute heaps of gold measured in dronas, jars, and raised from underneath the earth by ants and therefore called after these creatures. The mountain tribes endued with great strength having brought as tribute numerous chamaras, long brushes, soft and black and others white as moonbeam and sweet honey extracted from the flowers growing on the Himavat as also from the Mishali Champaka and garlands of flowers brought from the region of the northern Kurus and diverse kinds of plants from the north even from Kailasa, waited with their heads bent down at the gate of King Yudhishthira, being refused permission to enter. I also beheld their numberless chiefs of the Karatas armed with cruel weapons and ever engaged in cruel deeds, eating of fruits and roots and attired in skins and living on the northern slopes of the Himavat and on the mountain from behind which the sun rises and in the region of Karusha on the seacoast and on both sides of the Lohitya mountains. And, O king, having brought with them as tribute loads upon loads of sandal and aloe as also black aloe, and heaps upon heaps of valuable skins and gold and perfumes, and ten thousand serving girls of their own race, and many beautiful animals and birds of remote countries, and much gold of great splendor procured from mountains, the Karatas waited at the gate, being refused permission to enter. The Kairatas, the Dardas, the Darvas, the Suras, the Vyamakas, the Autumvaras, the Durvabhagas, the Kamaras, the Paratas along with the Valakas, the Kashmiras, the Garakas, the Hansakayanas, the Sivas, the Trigardas, the Yadhiyas, the ruler of Madras and the Kaikyas, the Amvastas, the Kaukaras, the Tarkshias, the Vastrapas along with the Palhavas, the Vashatayas the Malayas along with the Kshudrakas, and the Malavas, the Pandreyas, the Kukaras, the Sakas, the Angas, the Vangas, the Punras, the Sanavadias, and the Gaias these good and well-born Kshetriyas distributed into regular clans and trained to the use of arms, brought tribute unto King Yudhishthira by hundreds and thousands. And the Vangas, the Kalingas, the Magadas, the Tamraliptas, the Supandrakas, the Dovalakas, the Sagarakas, the Patronas, the Saisavas, and innumerable Karnapravaranas, who presented themselves at the gate, were told by the gatekeepers at the command of the king that if they could wait and bring good tribute, they could obtain admission. Then the kings of those nations each gave a thousand elephants furnished with tusks like unto the shafts of plows and decked with girdles made of gold and covered with fine blankets and therefore resembling the lotus in hue. And they were all darkish as rocks and always musty and procured from the sides of the Kamayaka lake and covered with defensive armor. And they were also exceedingly patient and of the best breed. And having made these presents, those kings were permitted to enter. O king, these and many others, coming from various regions, and numberless other illustrious kings, brought jewels and gems unto this sacrifice. And Katraratha, also the king of Gandharvs, the friend of Indra, gave four hundred horses gifted with the speed of the wind. And the Gandharv Tumvara gladly gave a hundred horses of the color of mango leaf and decked in gold. And, O thou of the Kuru race, the celebrated kings of the Mlechka tribe, called the Sukaras, gave many hundreds of excellent elephants. And Virata, the king of Matsya, gave his tribute two thousand elephants decked in gold. And King Vasudana from the kingdom of Pansu presented unto the son of Pandu six and twenty elephants and two thousand horses. 
O king, all decked in gold and endued with speed and strength and in full vigor of youth and diverse other kinds of wealth. And Yajnasena presented unto the sons of Pandu for the sacrifice fourteen thousand serving girls and ten thousand serving men with their wives, many hundreds of excellent elephants, six and twenty cars with elephants yoked unto them, and also his whole kingdom. And Vasudeva of the Vrishni race, in order to enhance the dignity of Arjuna, gave fourteen thousands of excellent elephants. Indeed, Krishna is the soul of Arjuna, and Arjuna is the soul of Krishna, and whatever Arjuna may say Krishna is certain to accomplish. And Krishna is capable of abandoning heaven itself for the sake of Arjuna. And Arjuna also is capable of sacrificing his life for the sake of Krishna. And the kings of Chola and Pandya, though they brought numberless jars of gold filled with fragrant sandal juice from the hills of Malaya, and loads of sandal and aloe wood from the Darduras hills, and many gems of great brilliancy and fine cloths inlaid with gold, did not obtain permission to enter. And the king of the Singalas gave those best of seaborne gems called the lapis lazuli, and heaps of pearls also, and hundreds of coverlets for elephants. And numberless dark-colored men with the ends of their eyes red as copper, attired in clothes decked with gems, waited at the gate with those presents. And numberless Brahmanas and Kshatriyas who had been vanquished, and Vaishas and serving Sudras, from love of Yudhishthira, brought tribute unto the son of Pandu. And even all the Mleches, from love and respect, came unto Yudhishthira. And all orders of men, good, indifferent, and low, belonging to numberless races, coming from diverse lands, made Yudhishthira's habitation the epitome of the world. And beholding the kings of the earth to present unto the foes such excellent and valuable presents, I wished for death out of grief. And, O king, I will now tell thee of the servants of the Pandavas, people for whom Yudhishthira supplieth food, both cooked and uncooked. There are a hundred thousand billions of mounted elephants and cavalry, and a hundred millions of cars, and countless foot soldiers. At one place raw provisions are being measured out, at another they are being cooked, and at another place the foods are being distributed, and the notes of festivity are being heard everywhere. And amongst men of all orders I beheld not a single one in the mansion of Yudhishthira that had not food and drink and ornaments. And eighty-eight thousands of Snataka Brahmanas leading domestic lives, all supported by Yudhishthira, with thirty serving girls given unto each, gratified by the king, always pray with complacent hearts for the destruction of his foes. And ten thousands of other ascetics with vital seed drawn up, daily eat of golden plates in Yudhishthira's palace. And, O king, Yajnasini, without having eaten herself, daily seeth whether everybody, including even the deformed and the dwarfs, hath eaten or not. And, O Bharata, only two do not pay tribute unto the son of Kunti, viz., the Panchalas in consequence of their relationship by marriage, and the Andhakas and Vrishnis in consequence of their friendship. Mahabharata, Book 2, Section 52 Duryodhana said, Those king that are revered over all the world, who are devoted to truth and who are pledged to the observance of rigid vows, who are possessed of great learning and eloquence, who are fully conversant with the Vedas and their branches as also with sacrifices, who have piety and modesty, whose souls are devoted to virtue, who possess fame, and who have enjoyed the grand rites of coronation, all wait upon and worship Yudhishthira. And, O king, I beheld there many thousands of wild kine with as many vessels of white copper for milking them, brought thither by the kings of the earth as sacrificial presents to be given away by Yudhishthira unto the Brahmana. And, O Bharata, for bathing Yudhishthira at the conclusion of the sacrifice, many kings with the greatest alacrity themselves brought there in a state of purity many excellent jars containing water. And King Valaka brought there a carved dick with pure gold. And King Sudakshina himself yoked there two for white horses of Cambodia breed, and Sunitha of great might fitted the lower pole, and the ruler of Chedi with his own hands took up and fitted the flagstaff. And the king of the southern country stood ready with the coat of mail, the ruler of Magadha, with garlands of flowers and the headgear, the great warrior Vasudana with a sixty years old elephant, the king of Matsya, with the side fittings of the car, all encased in gold, King Eklavya, with the shoes, the king of Avanti, with diverse kinds of water for the final bath, King Chekatana, with the quiver, the king of Kasi, with the bow, and Selia, with a sword whose hilt and straps were adorned, with gold. 
then Daumia and Vyasa, of great ascetic merit, with Narada and Asita's son Devala, standing before performed the ceremony of sprinkling the sacred water over the king. And the great rishis with cheerful hearts sat where the sprinkling ceremony was performed. And other illustrious rishis conversant with the Vedas, with Jamadagni's son among them, approached Yudhisthira, the giver of large sacrificial presents, uttering mantras all the while, like the seven rishis, approaching the great India in heaven. And Sudyaki of unbaffled prowess held the umbrella over the king's head. And Dhananjayat and Bhima were engaged in tanning the king, while the twins held a couple of chamaras in their hands. And the ocean himself brought in a sling that big conch of Varana which the celestial artificer Viswakarman had constructed with a thousand nishkas of gold, and which Prajapati had in a former kulpa presented unto India. It was with that conch that Krishna bathed Yudhisthira after the conclusion of the sacrifice, and beholding it, I swooned away. People go to the eastern or the western seas, and also to the southern one. But, O oh Father, none except birds can ever go to the northern sea. But the Pandavas have spread their dominion even there, for I heard hundreds of conches that had been brought thence blown in the sacrificial mansion, indicative of auspicious rejoicing. And while those conches blew simultaneously, my hair stood on end. And those among the kings, who were weak in strength, fell down. And Drishtadiyamna and Sudyaki and the sons of Pandu and Kesva, those eight, endued with strength and prowess and handsome in person, beholding the kings deprived of consciousness and myself in that plight, laughed outright. Then Vibhatsu, Arjuna, with a cheerful heart gave, O Bharata, unto the principal Brahmanas five hundred bullocks with horns plated with gold. And King Yudhisthira, the son of Kunti, having completed the Rajasuya sacrifice, obtained like the exalted Harishchandra such prosperity that neither Rantadeva nor Nabhaga, nor Juvanaswa, nor Manu, nor King Prithu the son of Veena, nor Bajaratha, Yayati, nor Nahusha, had obtained its like. And beholding, O exalted one, such prosperity, and the son of Pritha which is even like that which Harishchandra had, I do not see the least good in continuing to live, O Bharata. O ruler of men, a yoke that is tied to the bullock's shoulders by a blind man becomes loosened. Even such is the case with us. The younger ones are growing while the elder ones are decaying. And beholding all this, O chief of the Kurus, I cannot enjoy peace even with the aid of reflection. And it is for this, O king, that I am plunged into grief and becoming pale and emaciated. Mahabharata, Book 2, Section 53 Dhritarashtra said, Thou art my eldest son, and born also of my eldest wife. Therefore, O son, be not jealous of the Pandavas. He that is jealous is always unhappy and suffereth the pangs of death. O bull of the Bharata race, Yudhisthira knoweth not deception, possesseth wealth equal unto thine, hath thy friends for his, and is not jealous of thee. Why shouldst thou, therefore, be jealous of him? O king, in respect of friends and allies thou art equal unto Yudhisthira. Why shouldst thou, therefore, covet, from folly, the property of thy brother? Be not so. Cease to be jealous. Do not grieve. O bull of the Bharata race, if thou covetest the dignity attaching to the performance of a sacrifice, let the priests arrange for thee the great sacrifice, called the Saptatantu. The kings of the earth will then, cheerfully and with great respect, bring for thee also much wealth and gems and ornaments. O child, coveting others' possessions is exceedingly mean. He, on the other hand, enjoyeth happiness, who is content with his own being engaged in the practices of his own order. Never striving to obtain the wealth of others, persevering in one's own affairs, and protecting what hath been earned, these are the indications of true greatness. He that is unmoved in calamity, skilled in his own business, ever exerting vigilant and humble, always beholdeth prosperity. The sons of Pandu are as thy arms. Do not lop off those arms of thine. Plunge not into internal dissensions for the sake of that wealth of thy brothers. O king, be not jealous of the sons of Pandu. Thy wealth is equal unto that of thy brothers in his entirety. There is great sin in quarreling with friends. They that are thy grandsires are theirs also. Give away in charity on occasions of sacrifices, gratify every dear object of thy desire, disport in the company of women freely, and enjoy thou peace. 
Mahabharata, Book 2, Section 54. Duryodhana said, He that is devoid of intellect, but hath merely heard of many things, can scarcely understand the real import of the scriptures, like the spoon that hath no perception of the taste of the soup it toucheth. Thou knowest everything, but yet confoundest me. Like a boat fastened to another, thou and I are tied to each other. Art thou unmindful of thy own interests? Or, dost thou entertain hostile feeling towards me? These thy sons and allies are doomed to destruction, inasmuch as they have thee for their ruler, for thou describest as attainable in the future what is to be done at the present moment. He often trippeth whose guide acts under the instructions of others. How then can his followers expect to come across a right path? O king, thou art of mature wisdom, thou hast the opportunity to listen to the words of old, and thy senses also are under thy control. It behoveth thee not to confound us who are ready to seek our own interests. Verhaspity hath said that the usage of kings are different from those of common people. Therefore kings should always attend to their own interests with vigilance. The attainment of success is the sole criterion that should guide the conduct of a kshatriya. Whether, therefore, the means is virtuous or sinful, what scruples can there be in the duties of one's own order? He that is desirous of snatching the blazing prosperity of his foe should, O bull of the Barada race, bring every direction under his subjection like the charioteer taming the steeds with his whip. Those used to handling weapons say that a weapon is not simply an instrument that cuts, but is a means, whether covert or overt, that can defeat a foe. Who is to be reckoned a foe and who a friend doth not depend on one's figure or dimensions? He that paineth another is, O king, to be regarded a foe by him that is pained. Discontent is the root of prosperity. Therefore, O king, I desire to be discontented. He that striveth after the acquisition of prosperity is, O king, a truly politic person. Nobody should be attached to wealth and affluence, for the wealth that hath been earned and hoarded may be plundered. The usages of kings are even such. It was during a period of peace that Sakra cut off the head of Namuchi after having given a pledge to the contrary, and it was because he approved of this eternal usage towards the enemy that he did so. Like a snake that swalloweth up frogs and other creatures living in holes, the earth swalloweth up a king that is peaceful and a brahmana that stirreth not out of home. O king, none can by nature be any person's foe. He is one's foe, and not anybody else, who hath common pursuits with one. He that from folly neglecteth a growing foe, hath his vitals cut off as by a disease that he cherished without treatment. A foe, however insignificant, if suffered to grow in prowess, swalloweth one like the white ants at the root of a tree eating off the tree itself. O Barada, O Ajamata, let not the prosperity of the foe be acceptable to thee. This policy, of neglecting the foe, should always be borne on their heads by the wise even like a load. He that always wisheth for the increase of his wealth, ever groweth in the midst of his relatives even like the body naturally growing from the moment of birth. Prowess conferreth speedy growth. Coveting as I do the prosperity of the Pandavas. I have not yet made it my own. At present I am a prey to doubts in respect of my ability. I am determined to resolve those doubts of mine. I will either obtain that prosperity of theirs, or lie down having perished in battle. O king, when the state of my mind is such, what do I care now for life, for the Pandavas are daily growing while our possessions know no increase? Mahabharata, Book 2, Section 55 Sakuni said, O thou foremost of victorious persons, I will snatch, for thee, this prosperity of Yudhishthira, the son of Pandu, at the sight of which thou grievest so. Therefore, O king, let Yudhishthira, the son of Kunti, be summoned. By throwing dice a skillful man, himself uninjured, may vanquish one that hath no skill. No, O Bharata, that betting is my bow, the dice are my arrows, the marks on them my bowstring, and the dice board my car. Duryodhana said, This Sukuni skilled at dice is ready, O king, to snatch the prosperity of the son of Pandu by means of dice. It behoveth thee to give him permission. Dhritarashtra said, I am obedient to the counsels of my brother, the illustrious Vidura. Consulting with him, I shall tell what should be done in this matter. Duryodhana said, Vidura is always engaged in doing good to the sons of Pandu. 
O Kaurava, his feelings towards us are otherwise. He will, therefore, without doubt, withdraw thy heart from the proposed act. No man should set himself to any task depending upon the counsels of another, for, O son of Kuru's race, the minds of two persons seldom agree in any particular act. The fool that liveth shunning all causes of fear wasteth himself like an insect in the rainy season. Neither sickness nor yama waiteth till one is in prosperity. So long, therefore, as there is life and health, one should, without waiting for prosperity, accomplish his purpose. Dratarastra said, O son, hostility with those that are strong is what never recommendeth itself to me. Hostility bringeth about a change of feelings, and that itself is a weapon though not made of steel. Thou regardest, O prince, as a great blessing what will bring in its train the terrible consequences of war. What is really fraught with mischief? If once it beginneth, it will create sharp swords and pointed arrows. Duryodh now replied, Men of the most ancient times invented the use of dice. There is no destruction in it, nor is there any striking with weapons. Let the words of Sukuni, therefore, be acceptable to thee, and let thy command be issued for the speedy construction of the assembly house. The door of heaven, leading us to such happiness, will be opened to us by gambling. Indeed, they that betake to gambling, with such aid, deserve such good fortune. The Pandavas then will become thy equals, instead of, as now, superiors, therefore, gamble thou with the Pandavas. Dratarastra said, The words uttered by thee do not recommend themselves to me. Do what may be agreeable to thee, O ruler of men. But thou shalt have to repent for acting according to these words, for words that are fraught with such immorality can never bring prosperity in the future. Even this was foreseen by the learned Vidura ever treading the path of truth and wisdom. Even the great calamity, destructive of the lives of the Kshatriyas, cometh as destined by fate. Vaisampayana continued having said this, the weak-minded Dhritarashtra regarded fate as supreme and unavoidable. And the king, deprived of reason by fate and obedient to the counsels of his son, commanded his men in loud voice, saying carefully construct, without loss of time, an assembly house of the most beautiful description, to be called the crystal arched palace with a thousand columns, decked with gold and lapis lazuli, furnished with a hundred gates, and full two miles in length and in breadth the same. Hearing those words of his, thousands of artificers endued with intelligence and skill soon erected the palace with the greatest alacrity, and having erected it brought thither every kind of article. And soon after they cheerfully represented unto the king that the palace had been finished, and that it is delightful and handsome and furnished with every kind of gems, and covered with many-colored carpets and laid with gold. Then King Dhritarashtra, possessed of learning, summoning Vidura, the chief of his ministers, said, repairing, to Kandavaprastha, bring Prince Yudhisthira here without loss of time. Let him come hither with his brothers, and behold his handsome assembly house of mine, furnished with countless jewels and gems, and costly beds and carpets, and let a friendly match at dice commence here. Mahabharata, Book 2, Section 56 Vaisampayana said, King Dhritarashtra, ascertaining the inclinations of his son and knowing that fate is inevitable, did what I have said. Vidura, however, that foremost of intelligent men, approved not his brother's words and spoke thus, I approve not, O king, of this command of thine. Do not act so. I fear, this will bring about the destruction of our race. When thy sons lose their unity, dissension will certainly ensue amongst them. This I apprehend, O king, from this match at dice. Dhritarashtra said, If fate be not hostile, this quarrel will not certainly grieve me. The whole universe moveth at the will of its creator, under the controlling influence of fate. It is not free. Therefore, O Vidura, going unto King Yudhisthira at my command, bring thou soon that invincible son of Kunti. Mahabharata, Book 2, Section 57 Vaisampayana said, Vidura then, thus commanded against his will by King Dhritarashtra, set out, with the help of horses of high metal and endued with great speed and strength, and quiet and patient, for the abode of the wise sons of Pandu. Possessed of great intelligence, Vidura proceeded by the way leading to the capital of the Pandavas. And having arrived at the city of King Yudhisthira, he entered it and proceeded towards the palace, worshipped by numberless Brahmanas. 
and coming to the palace, which was even like unto the mansion of Kuvera himself, the virtuous Vidura approached Yudhishthira, the son of Dharma. Then the illustrious Ajamata, devoted to truth and having no enemy on earth, reverentially saluted Vidura and asked him about Dhritarashtra and his sons. And Yudhishthira said, O Kshata, thy mind seemeth to be cheerless. Dost thou come here in happiness and peace? The sons of Dhritarashtra, I hope, are obedient to their old father. The people also, I hope, are obedient to Dhritarashtra's rule. Vidura said, the illustrious king, with his sons, is well and happy, and surrounded by his relatives he reigneth even like Indra himself. The king is happy with his sons who are all obedient to him and hath no grief. The illustrious monarch is bent on his own aggrandizement. The king of the Kurus hath commanded me to inquire after thy peace and prosperity, and to ask thee to repair to Hastinapur with thy brothers, and to say, after beholding King Dhritarashtra's newly erected palace, whether that one is equal to thy own. Repairing thither, O son of Pritha, with thy brothers, enjoy ye in that mansion, and sit to a friendly match at dice. We shall be glad if thou goest, as the Kurus have already arrived there. And thou wilt see there those gamblers and cheats that the illustrious king Dhritarashtra hath already brought thither. It is for this, O king, that I have come hither. Let the king's command be approved by thee. Yudhisthira said, O Kshata, if we sit to a match at dice, we may quarrel. What man is there, who knowing all this, will consent to gamble? What dost thou think fit for us? We all are obedient to thy counsels. Vidura said, I know that gambling is the root of misery, and I strove to dissuade the king from it. The king, however, hath sent me to thee. Having known all this, O learned one, do what is beneficial. Yudhisthira said, Besides the sons of Dhritarashtra, what other dishonest gamblers are there ready for play? Tell us, O Vidura, who they are and with whom we shall have to play, staking hundreds upon hundreds of our possessions. Vidura said, O monarch, Sakuni, the king of Gandhara, an adept at dice, having great skill of hand and desperate in stakes, Vivingadi, King Chitrasena, Sadyavrat, Purumathrat, and Jaya, these, O king, are there. Yudhisthira said, It would seem then that some of the most desperate and terrible gamblers, always depending upon deceit, are there. This whole universe, however, is at the will of its maker, under the control of fate. It is not free. O learned one, I do not desire, at the command of King Dhritarashtra, to engage myself in gambling. The father always wisheth to benefit his son. Thou art our master, O Vidura. Tell me what is proper for us. Unwilling as I am to gamble, I will not do so, if the wicked Sakuni doth not summon me to it in the Sava. If, however, he challengeth me, I will never refuse. For that, as settled, is my eternal vow. Vaisampayana continued, King Yudhisthira, the just having said this unto Vidura, commanded that preparations for his journey might be made without loss of time. And the next day, the king accompanied by his relatives and attendants, and taking with him also the women of the household with Rupathi in their midst, set out for the capital of the Kurus. Like some brilliant body falling before the eyes, fate depriveth us of reason, and man, tied as it were with a cord, submitteth to the sway of providence, saying this, King Yudhisthira, that chastiser of the foe, set out with Kshata, without deliberating upon that summons from Dhritarashtra. And that slayer of hostile heroes, the son of Pandu and Pritha, riding upon the car that had been given him by the king of Valhika, and attired also in royal robes, set out with his brothers. And the king, blazing as it were with royal splendor, with brahmanas walking before him, set out from his city, summoned by Dhritarashtra and impelled by what hath been ordained by Kala, time. And arriving at Hastinapur, he went to the palace of Dhritarashtra. And going there, the son of Pandu approached the king. And the exalted one then approached Bhishma and Drona and Karna and Kripa and the son of Drona, and embraced and was embraced by them all. And the mighty-armed one, endued with great prowess, then approached Somadatta, and then Duryodhana and Salia, and the son of Suvala, and those other kings also that had arrived there before him. The king then went to the brave Dasasana, and then to all his other brothers, and then to Jayadratha, and next to all the Kurus, one after another. 
and the mighty armed one, then surrounded by all his brothers, entered the apartment of the wise king Dridarastra. And then Yudhisthira beheld the reverend Gandhari, ever obedient to her lord, and surrounded by her daughters-in-law like Rohini by the stars. And saluting Gandhari and blessed by her in return, the king then beheld his old uncle, that illustrious monarch whose wisdom was his eye. King Dridarastra then, O monarch, smelt his head as also the heads of those four other princes of the Kuru race, viz., the sons of Pandu with Bhimasena as their eldest. And, O king, beholding the handsome Pandava of those tigers among men, all the Kurus became exceedingly glad. And commanded by the king, the Pandavas then retired to the chambers allotted to them and which were all furnished with jewels and gems. And when they had retired into the chambers, the women of Dridarastra's household with Dusula taking the lead visited them. And the daughters-in-law of Dridarastra beholding the blazing and splendid beauty and prosperity of Yajnasini became cheerless and filled with jealousy. And those tigers among men, having conversed with the ladies, went through their daily physical exercises and then performed the religious rites of the day. And having finished their daily devotions, they decked their persons with sandal paste of the most fragrant kind. And desiring to secure good luck and prosperity, they caused, by gifts, the brahmanas to utter benedictions. And then eating food that was of the best taste, they retired to their chambers for the night. And those bulls among the Kurus then were put to sleep with music by handsome females. And obtaining from them what came in due succession, those subjugators of hostile towns passed with cheerful hearts that delightful night in pleasure and sport. And waked by the bards with sweet music, they rose from their beds, and having passed the night thus in happiness, they rose at dawn and having gone through the usual rites, they entered into the assembly house and were saluted by those that were ready there for gambling. Mahabharata, Book 2, Section 58 Vaisampayana said, The sons of Pritha with Yudhisthira at their head, having entered that assembly house, approached all the kings that were present there, and worshipping all those that deserved to be worshipped, and saluting others as each deserved according to age, they seated themselves on seats that were cleaned and furnished with costly carpets. After they had taken their seats, as also all the kings, Sakuni the son of Suvala addressed Yudhisthira and said, O king, the assembly is full. All had been waiting for thee. Let, therefore, the dice be cast and the rules of play be fixed, O Yudhisthira. Yudhisthira replied, Deceitful gambling is sinful. There is no kshatriya prowess in it. There is certainly no morality in it. Why, then, O king, dost thou praise gambling so? The wise applaud not the pride that gamesters feel in deceitful play. O Sakuni, vanquish us, not like a wretch, by deceitful means. Sakuni said, That high-souled player who knoweth the secrets of winning and losing, who is skilled in baffling the deceitful arts of his confrere, who is united in all the diverse operations of which gambling consisteth, truly knoweth the play, and he suffereth all in course of it. O son of Pritha, it is the staking at dice, which may be lost or one that may injure us. And it is for that reason that gambling is regarded as a fault. Let us, therefore, O king, begin the play. Fear not. Let the stakes be fixed. Delay not. Yudhisthira said that best of Munis, Devala, the son of Asita, who always instructeth us about all those acts that may lead to heaven, hell, or the other regions, hath said that it is sinful to play deceitfully with a gamester. To obtain victory in battle without cunning or stratagem is the best sport. Gambling, however, as a sport, is not so. Those that are respectable never use the language of the mleches, nor do they adopt deceitfulness in their behavior. War carried on without crookedness and cunning, this is the act of men that are honest. Do not, O Sukuni, playing desperately, win of us that wealth with which according to our abilities, we strive to learn how to benefit the Brahmanas. Even enemies should not be vanquished by desperate stakes and deceitful play. I do not desire either happiness or wealth by means of cunning. The conduct of one that is a gamester, even if it be without deceitfulness, should not be applauded. Sakuni said, O Yudhisthira, it is from a desire of winning, which is not a very honest motive, that one highborn person approacheth another, in a contest of race superiority. 
So also, it is from a desire of defeating, which is not a very honest motive, that one learned person approacheth another, in a contest of learning. Such motives, however, are scarcely regarded as really dishonest. So also, O Eudistyra, a person skilled at dice approacheth one that is not so skilled from a desire of vanquishing him. One also who is conversant with the truths of science approacheth another that is not from desire of victory, which is scarcely an honest motive. But, as I have already said, such a motive is not really dishonest. And, O Eudistyra, so also one that is skilled in weapons approacheth one that is not so skilled, the strong approacheth the weak. This is the practice in every contest. The motive is victory, O Eudistyra. If, therefore, thou, in approaching me, regardest me to be actuated by motives that are dishonest, if thou art under any fear, desist then from play. Eudistyra said, summoned, I do not withdraw. This is my established vow. And, O king, fate is all-powerful. We all are under the control of destiny. With whom in this assembly am I to play? Who is there that can stake equally with me? Let the play begin. Duryodhana said, O monarch, I shall supply jewels and gems and every kind of wealth. And it is for me that this Sakuni, my uncle, will play. Eudistyra said, Gambling for one's sake by the agency of another seemeth to me to be contrary to rule. Thou also, O learned one, will admit this. If, however, thou art still bent on it, let the play begin. Mahabharata, Book 2, Section 59 Vice Ampayana said, When the play commenced, all those kings with Dhritarashtra at their head took their seats in that assembly. And, O Bharata, Bhishma and Drona and Kripa and the high souled Vidura with cheerless hearts sat behind. And those kings with leonine necks and endued with great energy took their seats separately and in pairs upon many elevated seats of beautiful make and color. And, O king, that mansion looked resplendent with those assembled kings like heaven itself with a conclave of the celestials of great good fortune. And they were all conversant with the Vedas and brave and of resplendent countenances. And, O great king, the friendly match at dice then commenced. Eudistyra said, O king, this excellent wealth of pearls of great value, procured from the ocean by churning it, of old, so beautiful and decked with pure gold, this, O king, is my stake. What is thy counterstake, O great king, the wealth with which thou wishest to play with me? Duryodhana said, I have many jewels and much wealth, but I am not vain of them. Win thou this stake. Vice Ampayana continued, then Sakuni, well skilled at dice, took up the dice and, casting them, said unto Yudhishthira, Lo, I have one. Mahabharata, Book 2, Section 60 Eudistyra said, Thou hast won this stake of me by unfair means. But be not so proud, O Sakuni. Let us play staking thousands upon thousands. I have many beautiful jars, each full of a thousand nishkas in my treasury, inexhaustible gold, and much silver and other minerals. This, O king, is the wealth with which I will stake with thee. Vice Ampayana continued, thus addressed, Sakuni said unto the chief of the perpetuators of the Kuru race, the eldest of the sons of Pandu, King Yudhishthira, of glory incapable of sustaining any diminution. Lo, I have one. Yudhishthira said, This my sacred and victorious and royal car which gladdeneth the heart and hath carried us hither, which is equal unto a thousand cars, which is of symmetrical proportions and covered with tiger skin, and furnished with excellent wheels and flagstaffs, which is handsome, and decked with strings of little bells, whose clatter is even like the roar of the clouds or of the ocean, and which is drawn by eight noble steeds known all over the kingdom, and which are white as the Moonbeam, and from whose hoofs no terrestrial creature can escape this, O king, is my wealth with which I will stake with thee. Vice Ampayana continued, hearing these words, Sakuni ready with the dice, and adopting unfair means, said unto Eudistyra, Lo, I have one. Eudistyra said, I have a hundred thousand serving girls, all young, and decked with golden bracelets on their wrists and upper arms, and with nishkas round their necks and other ornaments, adorned with costly garlands and attired in rich robes, daubed with the sandal paste, wearing jewels and gold, and well skilled in the four and sixty elegant arts, especially versed in dancing and singing, and who wait upon and serve at my command the celestials, the Snataka Brahmanas, and kings. 
With this wealth, O king, I will stake with thee. Vice Ampiana continued, hearing these words, Sakuni ready with the dice, adopting unfair means, said unto Yudhishthira, Lo, I have one. Yudhishthira said, I have thousands of serving men, skilled in waiting upon guests, always attired in silken robes, endued with wisdom and intelligence, their senses under control though young, and decked with earrings, and who serve all guests night and day with plates and dishes in hand. With this wealth, O king, I will stake with thee. Vice Ampiana continued, hearing these words, Sakuni, ready with the dice, adopting unfair means, said unto Yudhishthira, Lo, I have one. Yudhishthira said, I have, O son of Suvala, one thousand musty elephants with golden girdles, decked with ornaments, with the mark of the lotus on their temples and necks and other parts, adorned with golden garlands, with fine white tusks long and thick as plowshafts, worthy of carrying kings on their backs, capable of bearing every kind of noise on the field of battle, with huge bodies, capable of battering down the walls of hostile towns, of the color of new-formed clouds, and each possessing eight she-elephants. With this wealth, O king, I will stake with thee. Vice Ampiana continued unto Yudhishthira, who had said so, Sakuni, the son of Suvala, laughingly said, Lo, I have won it. Yudhishthira said, I have as many cars as elephants, all furnished with golden poles and flagstaffs and well-trained horses and warriors that fight wonderfully, and each of whom receiveth a thousand coins as his monthly pay whether he fighteth or not. With this wealth, O king, I will stake with thee. Vice Ampiana continued, When these words had been spoken, the wretch Sakuni, pledged to enmity, said unto Yudhishthira, Lo, I have won it. Yudhishthira said, The steeds of the Tatiri, Kalmasha, and Gundherv breeds, decked with ornaments, which Katraratha having been vanquished in battle and subdued cheerfully gave unto Arjuna, the wielder of the Gandiva. With this wealth, O king, I will stake with thee. Vice Ampiana continued, hearing this, Sakuni, ready at dice, adopting unfair means, said unto Yudhishthira, Lo, I have one. Yudhishthira said, I have ten thousand cars and vehicles unto which are yoked draft animals of the foremost breed. And I have also sixty thousand warriors picked from each order by thousands, who are all brave and endued with prowess like heroes, who drink milk and eat good rice, and all of whom have broad chests. With this wealth, O king, I will stake with thee. Vice Ampiana continued, hearing this, Sakuni ready at dice, adopting unfair means, said unto Yudhishthira, Lo, I have one. Yudhishthira said, I have four hundred nineties, jewels of great value, encased in sheets of copper and iron. Each one of them is equal to five dronicas of the costliest and purest leaf gold of the Jatarupa kind. With this wealth, O king, I will stake with thee. Vice Ampiana continued, hearing this, Sakuni ready at dice, adopting foul means, said unto Yudhishthira, Lo, I have won it. Mahabharata, Book 2, Section 61 Vice Ampiana said, During the course of this gambling, certain to bring about utter ruin, on Yudhishthira, the Dura, the dispeller of all doubts, addressing Dhritarashtra, said, O great king, O thou of the Bharata race, attend to what I say, Although my words may not be agreeable to thee, like medicine to one that is ill and about to breathe his last. When this Duryodhana of sinful mind had, immediately after his birth, cried discordantly like a jackal, it was well known that he had been ordained to bring about the destruction of the Bharata race. Know, O king, that he will be the cause of death of ye all. A jackal is living in thy house, O king, in the form of Duryodhana. Thou knowest it not in consequence of thy folly. Listen now to the words of the poet, Sukra, which I will quote. They that collect honey in mountains, having received what they seek, do not notice that they are about to fall. Ascending dangerous heights, abstracted in the pursuit of what they seek, they fall down and meet with destruction. This Duryodhana also, maddened with the play at dice, like the collector of honey, abstracted in what he seeketh, marketh not the consequences. Making enemies of these great warriors, he beholdeth not the fall that is before him. It is known to thee, O thou of great wisdom, that amongst the Bojas they abandoned, for the good of the citizens, a son that was unworthy of their race. The Andhakas, the Yadavas, and the Bojas uniting together, abandoned Kansa. 
And afterwards, when at the command of the whole tribe, the same Kansa had been slain by Krishna that slayer of foes, all the men of the tribe became exceedingly happy for a hundred years. So at thy command, let Arjuna slay this Suyadana. And in consequence of the slaying of this wretch, let the Kurus be glad and pass their days in happiness. In exchange of a crow, O great king, by these peacocks to Pandavas, and in exchange of a jackal, by these tigers. For the sake of a family a member may be sacrificed, for the sake of a village a family may be sacrificed, for the sake of a province a village may be sacrificed, and for the sake of one's own soul the whole earth may be sacrificed. Even this was what the omniscient Kavya himself, acquainted with the thoughts of every creature, and a source of terror unto all foes, said unto the great Azurus to induce them to abandon Jamba at the moment of his birth. It is said that a certain king, having caused a number of wild birds that vomited gold to take up their quarters in his own house, afterwards killed them from temptation. O slayer of foes, blinded by temptation and the desire of enjoyment, for the sake of gold, the king destroyed at the same time both his present and future gains. Therefore, O king, prosecute not the Pandavas from desire of profit, even like the king in story. For then, blinded by folly thou wilt have to repent afterwards, even like the person that killed the birds. Like a flower seller that plucketh, many flowers, and the garden from trees that he cherisheth with affection from day to day, continue, O Bharata, to pluck flowers day by day from the Pandavas. Do not scorch them to their roots like a fire-producing breeze that reduceth everything to black charcoal. Go not, O king, unto the region of Yama, with thy sons and troops, for who is there that is capable of fighting with the sons of Pritha, together? Not to speak of others, is the chief of the celestials at the head of the celestials themselves capable of doing so? Mahabharata, Book 2, Section 62 The Dura said, Gambling is the root of dissensions. It bringeth about disunion. Its consequences are frightful. Yet having recourse to this, Dhritarashtra's son Duryodhana createth for himself fierce enmity. The descendants of Pratapa and Santanu, with their fierce troops and their allies the Valakas, will, for the sins of Duryodhana, meet with destruction. Duryodhana, in consequence of this intoxication, forcibly driveth away luck and prosperity from his kingdom, even like an infuriate bull breaking his own horns himself. That brave and learned person who, disregarding his own foresight, followeth, O king, the bent of, another man's heart, sinketh in terrible affliction even like one that goeth into the sea in a boat guided by a child. Duryodhana is gambling with the son of Pandu, and thou art in raptures that he is winning. And it is such success that begateth war, which in death in the destruction of men. This fascination of gambling that thou hast well devised only leadeth to dire results. Thus hast thou simply brought on by these counsels great affliction to thy heart. And this thy quarrel with Yudhisthira, who is so closely related to thee, even if thou hadst not foreseen it, is still approved by thee. Listen, ye sons of Santanu, ye descendants of Pratapa, who are now in this assembly of the Kauravas, to these words of wisdom. Enter ye not into the terrible fire that hath blazed forth following the rich. When Ajitasatru, the son of Pandu, intoxicated with dice, giveth way to his wrath, and Vrakodara and Arjuna and the twins do the same, who, in that hour of confusion, will prove your refuge. O great king, thou art thyself a mine of wealth. Thou canst earn, by other means, as much wealth as thou seekest to earn by gambling. What dost thou gain by winning from the Pandavas their vast wealth? Win the Pandavas themselves, who will be to thee more than all the wealth they have. We all know the skill of Suvala in play. This hill king knoweth many nefarious methods in gambling. Let Sakuni return whence he came. War not, O Bharata, with the sons of Pandu. Mahabharata, Book 2, Section 63 Duryodhana said, O Kshata, thou art always boasting of the fame of our enemies, deprecating the sons of Dhritarashtra. We know, O Vidura, of whom thou art really fond. Thou always disregardest us as children, that man standeth confused, who wisheth for success unto those that are near to him and defeat unto those that are not his favorites. His praise and blame are applied accordingly. Thy tongue and mind betray thy heart. But the hostility thou showeth in speech is even greater than what is in thy heart. 
Thou hast been cherished by us like a serpent on our lap. Like a cat thou wishest evil unto him that cherisheth thee. The wise have said that there is no sin graver than that of injuring one's master. How is it, O Kshada, that thou dost not fear this sin? Having vanquished our enemies, we have obtained great advantages. Use not harsh words in respect of us. Thou art always willing to make peace with the foes. And it is for this reason that thou hatest us always. A man becometh a foe by speaking words that are unpardonable. Then again, in praising the enemy, the secrets of one's own party should not be divulged. Thou, however, transgressest this rule. Therefore, O thou parasite, why dost thou obstruct us so? Thou sayest whatever thou wishest. Insult us not. We know thy mind. Go and learn sitting at the feet of the old. Keen up the reputation that thou hast won. Meddle not with the affairs of other men. Do not imagine that thou art our chief. Tell us not harsh words always, O Vidura. We do not ask thee what is for our good. Cease, irritate not those that have already borne too much at thy hands. There is only one controller, no second. He controlleth even the child that is in the mother's womb. I am controlled by him. Like water that always floweth in a downward course, I am acting precisely in the way in which he is directing me. He that breaketh his head against a stone wall, and he that feedeth a serpent, are guided in those acts of theirs by their own intellect. Therefore, in this matter I am guided by my own intelligence. He becometh a foe who seeketh to control others by force. When advice, however, is offered in a friendly spirit, the learned bear with it. He again that hath set fire to such a highly inflammable object as camphor, beholdeth not its ashes. If he runneth immediately to extinguish it, one should not give shelter to another who is the friend of his foes, or to another who is ever jealous of his protector, or to another who is evil-minded. Therefore, O Vidura, go whithersoever thou pleasest. A wife that is unchaste, however well treated, forsaketh her husband yet. Vidura addressing Dhritarashtra, said, O monarch, tell us, impartially, like a witness, what thou thinkest of the conduct of those who abandon their serving men thus for giving instruction to them. The hearts of kings are, indeed, very fickle. Granting protection at first, they strike with clubs at last. O prince, Duryodhana, thou regardest thyself as mature in intellect, and, O thou of bad heart, thou regardest me as a child. But consider that he is a child who, having first accepted one for a friend, subsequently findeth fault with him. An evil-hearted man can never be brought to the path of rectitude, like an unchaste wife in the house of a well-born person. Assuredly, instruction is not agreeable to this bull of the Barada race like a husband of sixty years to a damsel that is young. After this, O king, if thou wishest to hear words that are agreeable to thee, in respect of all acts good or bad, ask thou women and idiots and cripples or persons of that description. A sinful man speaking words that are agreeable may be had in this world. But a speaker of words that are disagreeable though sound as regimen, or a hearer of the same, is very rare. He indeed is a king's true ally who disregarding what is agreeable or disagreeable to his master beareth himself virtuously and uttereth what may be disagreeable but necessary as regimen. O great king, drink thou that which the honest drink and the dishonest shun, even humility, which is like a medicine that is bitter, pungent, burning, unintoxicating, disagreeable, and revolting. And drinking it, O king, regain thou thy sobriety. I always wish Dhritarashtra and his son's affluence and fame. Happen what may unto thee, here I bow to thee, and take my leave. Let the Brahmanas wish me well. O son of Kuru, this is the lesson I carefully inculcate, that the wise should never enrage such as adders as have venom in their very glances. Mahabharata, Book 2, Section 64 Sakuni said, Thou hast, O Yudhisthira, lost much wealth of the Pandavas. If thou hast still anything that thou hast not yet lost to us, O son of Kunti, tell us what it is. Yudhisthira said, O son of Suvala, I know that I have untold wealth. But why is it, O Sakuni, that thou askest me of my wealth? 
Let tens of thousands and millions and millions and tens of millions and hundreds of millions and tens of billions and hundreds of billions and trillions and tens of trillions and hundreds of trillions and tens of quadrillions and hundreds of quadrillions and even more wealth be staked by thee. I have as much. With that wealth, O king, I will play with thee. Vice Ampiana said, hearing this, Sakuni, ready with the dice, adopting unfair means, said unto Yudhishthira, Lo, I have one. Yudhishthira said, I have, O son of Suvala, immeasurable kind and horses and milch cows with calves and goats and sheep in the country extending from the Parnassa to the eastern bank of the Sindhu. With this wealth, O king, I will play with thee. Vice Ampiana said, hearing this Sakuni, ready with the dice, adopting unfair means, said unto Yudhishthira, Lo, I have one. Yudhishthira said, I have my city, the country, land, the wealth of all dwelling therein except of the Brahmanas, and all those persons themselves except Brahmanas still remaining to me. With this wealth, O king, I will play with thee. Vice Ampiana said, hearing this, Sakuni, ready with the dice, adopting foul means, said unto Yudhishthira, Lo, I have one. Yudhishthira said, These princes here, O king, who look resplendent in their ornaments and their earrings and nishkas and all the royal ornaments on their persons are now my wealth. With this wealth, O king, I play with thee. Vice Ampiana said, hearing this, Sakuni, ready with his dice, adopting foul means, said unto Yudhishthira, Lo, I have won them. Yudhishthira said, This Nakula here, of mighty arms and leonine neck, of red eyes and endued with youth, is now my one stake. Know that he is my wealth. Sakuni said, O King Yudhishthira, Prince Nakula is dear to thee. He is already under our subjection. With whom, as stake, wilt thou now play? Vice Ampiana said, Saying this, Sakuni cast those dice, and said unto Yudhishthira, Lo! He hath been won by us. Yudhishthira said, This Sadeva administereth justice. He hath also acquired a reputation for learning in this world. However undeserving he may be to be staked in play, with him as stake I will play, with such a dear object as it, indeed, he were not so. Vice Ampiana said, Hearing this, Sakuni, ready with the dice, adopting foul means, said unto Yudhishthira, Lo! I have one. Sakuni continued, O king, the sons of Madri, dear unto thee, have both been won by me. It would seem, however, that Bhimasena and the Nanjaya are regarded very much by thee. Yudhishthira said, Wretch, thou actest sinfully in thus seeking to create disunion amongst us who are all of one heart, disregarding morality. Sakuni said, One that is intoxicated falleth into a pit, hell, and stayeth there deprived of the power of motion. Thou art, O king, senior to us in age, and possessed of the highest accomplishments. O bull of the Barada race, I beg my pardon and bow to thee. Thou knowest, O Yudhishthira, that gamesters, while excited with play, utter such ravings that they never indulge in the like of them in their waking moments nor even in dream. Yudhishthira said, He that taketh us like a boat to the other shore of the sea of battle, he that is ever victorious over foes, the prince who is endued with great activity, he who is the one hero in this world, is here. With that Falguna at stake, however, undeserving of being made so, I will now play with thee. Vice Ampiana said, Hearing this, Sakuni, ready with the dice, adopting foul means, said unto Yudhishthira, Lo, I have one. Sakuni continued, This foremost of all wielders of the bow, this son of Pandu capable of using both his hands with equal activity hath now been won by me. O play now with the wealth that is still left unto thee, even with Bhima thy dear brother, as thy stake, O son of Pandu. Yudhishthira said, O king, however, undeserving he may be of being made a stake, I will now play with thee by staking by Messina, that prince who is our leader, who was the foremost in fight, even like the wielder of the thunderbolt, the one enemy of the Denavas, the high-souled one with leonine neck and arched eyebrows and eyes looking askance, who is incapable of putting up with an insult, who hath no equal and might in the world, who is the foremost of all wielders of the mace, and who grindeth all foes. Vice Ampiana said, hearing this, Sakuni, ready with the dice adopting foul means, said unto Yudhishthira, Lo! I have one. 
Sukuni continued, Thou hast, O son of Kunti, lost much wealth, horses, and elephants, and thy brothers as well. Say, if thou hast anything which thou hast not lost. Yudhishthira, said I alone, the eldest of all my brothers, and dear unto them, am still unwon. One by thee, I will do what he that is one will have to do. Vaisampayana said, hearing this Sukuni, ready with the dice, adopting foul means, said unto Yudhishthira, Lo! I have one. Sukuni continued, Thou hast permitted thyself to be one. This is very sinful. There is wealth still left to thee, O king. Therefore, thy having lost thyself is certainly sinful. Vaisampayana continued, having said this, Sukuni, well skilled at dice, spoke unto all the brave kings present there of his having won, one after another, all the Pandavas. The son of Suvala then, addressing Yudhishthira, said, O king, there is still one stake dear to thee that is still unwon. Stake thou Krishna, the princess of Panchala. By her, win thyself back. Yudhishthira said, With Ropathi a stake, who is neither short nor tall, neither spared nor corpulent, and who is possessed of blue curly locks, I will now play with thee. Possessed of eyes like the leaves of the autumn lotus, and fragrant also as the autumn lotus, equal in beauty unto her, Lakshmi, who delighteth in autumn lotuses, and unto Shri herself in symmetry and every grace she is such a woman as a man may desire for wife in respect of softness of heart and wealth of beauty and of virtues. Possessed of every accomplishment and compassionate and sweet speech, she is such a woman as a man may desire for wife in respect of her fitness for the acquisition of virtue and pleasure and wealth. Retiring to bed last and waking up first, she looketh after all down to the cowherds and the shepherds. Her face too, when covered with sweat, looketh as the lotus or the jasmine. Of slender waist like that of the wasp, of long flowing locks, of red lips, and body without down, is the princess of Panchala. O king, making the slender waisted Draupadi, who is even such as my stake, I will play with thee, O son of Suvala. Vaisampayana continued, when the intelligent king Yudhishthira the just has spoken thus, Phi. Phi were the words that were uttered by all the aged persons that were in the assembly. And the whole conclave was agitated, and the kings who were present there all gave way to grief. And Bhishma and Drona and Kripa were covered with perspiration. And Vidura holding his head between his hands sat like one that had lost his reason. He sat with face downwards giving way to his reflections and sighing like a snake. But Dhritarashtra glad, at heart, asked repeatedly, Hath the stake been won? Hath the stake been won, and could not conceal his emotions? Karna with Dasasana and others laughed aloud, while tears began to flow from the eyes of all other present in the assembly. And the son of Suvala, proud of success and flurried with excitement and repeating, Thou hast one stake, dear to thee, etc., said, Lo, I have won and took up the dice that had been cast. Mahabharata, Book 2, Section 65 Duryodhana said, Come, Kshata, bring hither the Upadhi, the dear and loved wife of the Pandavas. Let her sweep the chambers, force her there too, and let the unfortunate one stay where our serving women are. The Dura said, Dost thou not know, O wretch, that by uttering such harsh words thou art tying thyself with cords? Dost thou not understand that thou art hanging on the edge of a precipice? Dost thou not know that being a deer thou provokest so many tigers to rage? Snakes of deadly venom, provoked to ire, are on thy head. Wretch, do not further provoke them lest thou goest to the region of Yama. In my judgment, slavery does not attach to Krishna, inasmuch as she was staked by the king after he had lost himself and ceased to be his own master. Like the bamboo that beareth fruit only when it is about to die, the son of Dhritarashtra winneth this treasure at play. Intoxicated, he perceiveth nor in these his last moments that dice bring about enmity and frightful terrors. No man should utter harsh speeches and pierce the hearts of the others. No man should subjugate his enemies by dice and such other foul means. No one should utter such words as are disapproved by the Vedas and lead to hell and annoy others. Some one uttereth from his lips words that are harsh. Stung by them another burneth day and night. These words pierce the very heart of another. The learned, therefore, should never utter them, pointing them at others. 
A goat had once swallowed a hook, and when it was pierced with it, the hunter placing the head of the animal on the ground tore its throat frightfully in drawing it out. Therefore, O Duryodhana, swallow not the wealth of the Pandavas. Make them not thy enemies. The sons of Pritha never use words such as these. It is only low men that are like dogs who use harsh words towards all classes of people, viz., those that have retired to the woods, those leading domestic lives, those employed in ascetic devotions, and those that are of great learning. Alas! The son of Dhritarashtra knoweth not that dishonesty is one of the frightful doors of hell. Alas! Many of the Kurus with Dasasana amongst them have followed him in the path of dishonesty in the matter of this play at dice. Even gourds may sink and stones may float, and boats also may always sink in water. Still this foolish king, the son of Dhritarashtra, listeneth not to my words that are even as regimen unto him. Without doubt, he will be the cause of the destruction of the Kurus. When the words of wisdom spoken by friends, and which are even as fit regimen, are not listened to, but on the other hand temptation is on the increase, a frightful and universal destruction is sure to overtake all the Kurus. Mahabharata, Book 2, Section 66 Vaisampayana said, intoxicated with pride, the son of Dhritarashtra spake, Phi on Kshata, and casting his eyes upon the Pratikaman in attendance, commanded him, in the midst of all those reverend seniors, saying, Go Pratikaman, and bring thou the Rupadi hither. Thou hast no fear from the sons of Pandu. It is Vidura alone that raveth in fear. Besides, he never wisheth our prosperity. Vaisampayana continued, thus commanded, the Pratikaman, who was of the Suda caste, hearing the words of the king, proceeded with haste, and entering the abode of the Pandavas, like a dog in a lion's den, approached the queen of the sons of Pandu. And he said, Yudhisthira having been intoxicated with dice, Duryodhana, O Dhrupadi, hath won thee. Come now, therefore, to the abode of Dhritarashtra. I will take thee, O Yajnasini, and put thee in some menial work. Dhrupadi said, Why, O Pratikaman, dost thou say so? What prince is there who playeth staking his wife? The king was certainly intoxicated with dice. Else, could he not find any other object to stake? The Pratikaman said, When he had nothing else to stake, it was then that Ajitasatru, the son of Pandu, staked thee. The king had first staked his brothers, then himself, and then thee, O princess. Dhrupadi said, O son of the Suda race, go, and ask the gambler present in the assembly, whom he hath lost first, himself, or me. Ascertaining this, come hither, and then take me with thee, O son of the Suda race. Vaisampayana continued, the messenger coming back to the assembly told all present the words of Dhrupadi. And he spoke unto Yudhisthira, sitting in the midst of the kings, These words, Dhrupadi hath asked thee, whose lord wert thou at the time thou lost me in play? Didst thou lose thyself first, or me? Yudhisthira, however, sat there like one demented and deprived of reason, and gave no answer good or ill to the Suda. Duryodhana then said, Let the princess of Panchala come hither and put her question. Let every one hear in this assembly the words that pass between her and Yudhisthira. Vaisampayana continued, the messenger, obedient to the command of Duryodhana, going once again to the palace, himself much distressed, said unto Dhrupadi, O princess, they that are in the assembly are summoning thee. It seemeth that the end of the Kauravas is at hand. When Duryodhana, O princess, is for taking thee before the assembly, this weak-brained king will no longer be able to protect his prosperity. Dhrupadi said, The great ordainer of the world hath, indeed, ordained so. Happiness and misery pay their court to both the wise and unwise. Morality, however, it hath been said, is the one highest object in the world. If cherished, that will certainly dispense blessings to us. Let not that morality now abandon the Kauravas. Going back to those that are present in that assembly, repeat these my words consonant with morality. I am ready to do what those elderly and virtuous persons conversant with morality will definitely tell me. Vaisampayana continued, the Suda, hearing these words of Yajnasini, came back to the assembly and repeated the words of Dhrupadi. But all sat with faces downwards, uttering not a word, knowing the eagerness and resolution of Dhritarashtra's son. 
Yudhishthira, however, O bull of the Bharata race, hearing of Duryodhana's intentions, sent a trusted messenger unto Draupadi, directing that although she was attired in one piece of cloth with her navel itself exposed, in consequence of her season having come, she should come before her father-in-law weeping bitterly. And that intelligent messenger, O king, having gone to Draupadi's abode with speed, informed her of the intentions of Yudhishthira. The illustrious Pandavas, meanwhile, distressed and sorrowful, and bound by promise, could not settle what they should do. And casting his eyes upon them, King Duryodhana, glad at heart, addressed the Suda and said, O Pratikaman, bring her hither. Let the Kauravas answer her question before her face. The Suda, then, obedient to his commands, but terrified at the, possible, wrath of the daughter of Drupada, disregarding his reputation for intelligence, once again said to those that were in the assembly, What shall I say unto Krishna? Duryodhana, hearing this, said, O Dasasana, this son of my Suda, of little intelligence, feareth Vrakodara. Therefore, go thou thyself and forcibly bring hither the daughter of Yajnasena. Our enemies at present are dependent on our will. What can they do thee? Hearing the command of his brother, Prince Desasan arose with blood-red eyes, and entering the abode of those great warriors, spake these words unto the princess, Come, come, O Krishna, princess of Panchala, thou hast been won by us. And O thou of eyes large as lotus leaves, come now and accept the Kurus for thy lords. Thou hast been won virtuously, come to the assembly. At these words, Draupadi, rising up in great affliction, rubbed her pale face with her hands, and distressed she ran to the place where the ladies of Dhritarashtra's household were. At this, Desasana roaring in anger, ran after her and seized the queen by her locks, so long and blue and wavy. Alas! Those locks that had been sprinkled with water sanctified with mantras in the great Rajasuya sacrifice were now forcibly seized by the son of Dhritarashtra disregarding the prowess of the Pandavas. And Dasasana dragging Krishna of long, long locks unto the presence of the assembly as if she were helpless though having powerful protectors and pulling at her, made her tremble like the banana plant in a storm. And dragged by him, with body bent, she faintly cried rich. It ill behoveth thee to take me before the assembly. My season hath come, and I am now clad in one piece of attire. But Dasasana dragging Draupadi forcibly by her black locks while she was praying piteously unto Krishna and Vishnu who were Narayana and Nara on earth, said unto her whether thy season hath come or not, whether thou art attired in one piece of cloth or entirely naked, when thou hast been one at dice and made our slave, thou art to live amongst our serving women as thou pleasest. Vaisampayana continued, with hair disheveled and half her attire loosened, all the while dragged by Dasasana, the modest Krishna consumed with anger, faintly said in this assembly are persons conversant with all the branches of learning devoted to the performance of sacrifices and other rites, and all equal unto Indra, persons some of whom are really my superiors and others who deserve to be respected as such. I cannot stay before them in this state. O oh, wretch! O thou of cruel deeds, drag me not so. Uncover me not so. The princes, my lords, will not pardon thee, even if thou hast the gods themselves with Indra as thy allies. The illustrious son of Dharma is now bound by the obligations of morality. Morality, however, is subtle. Those only that are possessed of great clearness of vision can ascertain it. In speech even I am unwilling to admit an atom of fault in my lord forgetting his virtues. Thou draggest me who am in my season before these Kuru heroes. This is truly an unworthy act. But no one here rebuketh thee. Assuredly, all these are of the same mind with thee. O oh, fie! Truly hath the virtue of the Bharata gone. Truly also hath the usage of those acquainted with the Kshatriya practice disappeared. Else these Kurus in this assembly would never have looked silently on this act that transgresseth the limits of their practices. Oh! Both Drona and Bhishma have lost their energy, and so also hath the high-souled Kshata, and so also this king. Else, why do these foremost of the Kuru elders look silently on this great crime? Vaisampayana continued, Thus did Krishna of slender waist cry in distress in that assembly and casting a glance upon her enraged lords the Pandavas who were filled with terrible wrath, she inflamed them further with that glance of hers. 
and they were not so distressed at having been robbed of their kingdom, of their wealth, of their costliest gems, as with that glance of Krishna moved by modesty and anger. And Desasana, beholding Krishna looking at her helpless lords, dragging her still more forcibly, and addressed her, slave, slave, and laughed aloud. And at those words Karna became very glad and approved of them by laughing aloud. And Sukuni, the son of Suvala, the Gandhara king, similarly applauded Desasana. And amongst all those that were in the assembly except these three and Duryodhana, every one was filled with sorrow at beholding Krishna thus dragged in sight of that assembly. And beholding it all, Bhishma said, O blessed one, morality is subtle. I therefore am unable to duly decide this point that thou hast put, beholding that on the one hand one that hath no wealth cannot stake the wealth belonging to others, while on the other hand wives are always under the orders and at the disposal of their lords. Yudhisthira can abandon the whole world full of wealth, but he will never sacrifice morality. The son of Pandu hath said I am one. Therefore, I am unable to decide this matter. Sakuni hath not his equal among men at dice play. The son of Kunti still voluntarily staked with him. The illustrious Yudhisthira doth not himself regard that Sakuni hath played with him deceitfully. Therefore, I cannot decide this point. Dhrupadi said, the king was summoned to this assembly, and though possessing no skill at dice, he was made to play with skillful, wicked, deceitful, and desperate gamblers. How can he be said then to have staked voluntarily? The chief of the Pandavas was deprived of his senses by wretches of deceitful conduct and unholy instincts, acting together, and then vanquished. He could not understand their tricks, but he hath now done so. Here, in this assembly, there are Kurus who are the lords of both their sons and their daughters-in-law. Let all of them, reflecting well upon my words, duly decide the point that I have put. Vaisampayana continued unto Krishna, who was thus weeping and crying piteously, looking at times upon her helpless lord, Dasasana spake many disagreeable and harsh words. And beholding her who was then in her season thus dragged, and her upper garments loosened, beholding her in that condition which she little deserved, Vrakotara afflicted beyond endurance, his eyes fixed upon Yudhisthira, gave way to wrath. Mahabharata, Book 2, Section 67 Bhima said, O Yudhisthira, gamblers have in their houses many women of loose character. They do not yet stake those women having kindness for them even. Whatever wealth and other excellent articles the king of Kasi gave, whatever, gems, animals, wealth, coats of mail and weapons that other kings of the earth gave, our kingdom, thyself and ourselves, have all been won by the foes. At all this my wrath was not excited for thou art our lord. This, however, I regard as a highly improper act this act of staking Vrupadi. This innocent girl deserveth not this treatment. Having obtained the Pandavas as her lords, it is for thee alone that she is being thus persecuted by the low, despicable, cruel, and mean-minded Kauravas. It is for her sake, O king, that my anger falleth on thee. I shall burn those hands of thine. Sadeva, bring some fire. Arjuna hearing this, said, Thou hast never, O Bhimasena, before this uttered such words as these. Assuredly thy high morality hath been destroyed by these cruel foes. Thou shouldst not fulfill the wishes of the enemy. Practice thou the highest morality. Whom doth it behave to transgress his virtuous eldest brother? The king was summoned by the foe, and remembering the usage of the Kshatriyas, he played at dice against his will. That is certainly conducive to our great fame. Bhima said, If I had not known, O the Nanjaya, that the king had acted according to Kshatriya usage, then I would have, taking his hands together by sheer force, burnt them in a blazing fire. Vaisampayana continued, Beholding the Pandavas thus distressed and the princess of Panchala also thus afflicted, the Karna the son of Dhritarashtra said, Ye kings, answer ye the question that hath been asked by Yajnasini. If we do not judge a matter referred to us, all of us will assuredly have to go to hell without delay. How is that Bhishma and Dhritarashtra, both of whom are the oldest of the Kurus, as also the high-souled Vidura, do not say anything? The son of Bharadvaja, who is the preceptor of us, as also Kripa, is here. Why do not these best of regenerate ones answer the question? 
Let also those other kings assembled here from all directions answer according to their judgment this question, leaving aside all motives of gain and anger. Ye kings, answer ye the question that hath been asked by this blessed daughter of King Drupada, and declare after reflection on which side each of ye is. Thus did Vikarna repeatedly appeal to those that were in that assembly. But those kings answered him not one word, good or ill. And Vikarna, having repeatedly appealed to all the kings, began to rub his hands and sigh like a snake. And at last the prince said, Ye kings of the earth, ye Kauravas, whether ye answer this question or not, I will say what I regard as just and proper. Ye foremost of men, it hath been said that hunting, drinking, gambling, and too much enjoyment of women are the four vices of kings. The man that is addicted to these liveth forsaking virtue. And people do not regard the acts done by a person who is thus improperly engaged as of any authority. This son of Pandu, while deeply engaged in one of these vicious acts, urged thereto by deceitful gamblers, made Drupadi a stake. The innocent Drupadi is, besides, the common wife of all the sons of Pandu. And the king, having first lost himself, offered her as a stake. And Suvala himself desirous of a stake, indeed prevailed upon the king to stake this Krishna. Reflecting upon all these circumstances, I regard Drupadi as not one. Hearing these words, a loud uproar rose from among those present in that assembly. And they all applauded Vikarna and censured the son of Suvala. And at that sound, the son of Radha, deprived of his senses by anger, waving his well-shaped arms, said these words, O Vikarna, many opposite and inconsistent conditions are noticeable in this assembly. Like fire produced from a faggot, consuming the faggot itself, this thy ire will consume thee. These personages here, though urged by Krishna, have not uttered a word. They all regard the daughter of Drupada to, O younger brother of Duryodhana, thou dost not know what morality truly is, for thou sayest like a fool that this Krishna who hath been, justly, one is not one at all. O son of Dhritarashtra, how dost thou regard Krishna as not one, when the eldest of the Pandavas before this assembly staked all his possessions? O bull of the Bharata race, Drupathi is included in all the possessions of Yudhishthira. Therefore, why regardest thou Krishna who hath been justly one as not one? Drupathi had been mentioned by Suvala and approved of as a stake by the Pandavas. For what reason then dost thou yet regard her as not one? Or, if thou thinkest that bringing her hither attired in a single piece of cloth is an action of impropriety, listen to certain excellent reasons I will give. O son of the Kuru race, the gods have ordained only one husband for one woman. This Draupadi, however, hath many husbands. Therefore, certain it is that she is an unchaste woman. To bring her, therefore, into this assembly attired though she be in one piece of cloth even to uncover her is not at all an act that may cause surprise. Whatever wealth the Pandavas had she herself and these Pandavas themselves have all been justly won by the son of Suvala. O Dasasana, this Vikarna speaking words of apparent wisdom is but a boy. Take off the robes of the Pandavas as also the attire of Rupadi. Hearing these words, the Pandavas, O Bharata, took of their upper garments and throwing them down sat in that assembly. Then Dasasana, O king, forcibly seizing Rupadi's attire before the eyes of all, began to drag it off her person. Vaisampayana continued, when the attire of Drupadi was being thus dragged, the thought of Hari, and she herself cried aloud, saying, O Govinda, O thou who dwellest in Dvarka, O Krishna, O thou who art fond of cowherdesses of Vrindavana. O Kesva, sayest thou not that the Kauravas are humiliating me? O Lord, O husband of Lakshmi, O Lord of Raja, Vrindavana, O destroyer of all afflictions, O Janadana, rescue me who am sinking in the Kaurava ocean. O Krishna, O Krishna, O thou great yogin, thou soul of the universe, thou creator of all things, O Govinda, save me who am distressed, who am losing my senses in the midst of the Kurus. Thus did that afflicted lady resplendent still in her beauty, O king covering her face cried aloud, thinking of Krishna, of Hari, of the lord of the three worlds. Hearing the words of the Rupadi, Krishna was deeply moved. And leaving his seat, the benevolent one from compassion arrived there on foot. And while Yajnasini was crying aloud to Krishna, 
also called Vishnu and Hari and Nara for protection, the illustrious Dharma, remaining unseen, covered her with excellent clothes of many hues. And, O oh monarch, as the attire of Rupathi was being dragged, after one was taken off, another of the same kind appeared covering her. And thus did it continue till many clothes were seen. And, O oh exalted on, owing to the protection of Dharma, hundreds upon hundreds of robes of many hues came off Rupathi's person. And there arose then a deep uproar of many, many voices. And the kings present in that assembly beholding that most extraordinary of all sights in the world began to applaud Drupathi and censure the son of Dhritarashtra. And Bhima then, squeezing his hands, with lips quivering in rage, swore in the midst of all those kings a terrible oath in a loud voice. And Bhima said, Hear these words of mine, ye Kshatriyas of the world. Words such as these were never before uttered by other men, nor will anybody in the future ever utter them. Ye lords of earth, if having spoken these words I do not accomplish them hereafter, let me not obtain the region of my deceased ancestors. Tearing open in battle, by sheer force, the breast of this wretch, this wicked-minded scoundrel of the Barada race, if I do not drink his lifeblood, let me not obtain the region of my ancestors. Vice Ampayana continued, hearing these terrible words of Bhima that made the down of the auditors to stand on end, everybody present there applauded him and censured the son of Dhritarashtra. And when a mass of clothes had been gathered in that assembly, all dragged from the person of Drupadi, Dasasana, tired and ashamed, sat down. And beholding the sons of Kunti in that state, the persons those gods among men that were in that assembly all uttered the word Phi, on the son of Dhritarashtra. And the united voices of all became so loud that they made the down of anybody who heard them stand on end. And all the honest men that were in that assembly began to say, Alas! The Kauravas answer not the question that hath been put to them by the Rupadi. And all censuring Dhritarashtra together made a loud clamor. Then Vidura, that master of the science of morality, waving his hands and silencing every one, spake these words, Ye that are in this assembly, Vrupathi having put her question is weeping helplessly. Ye are not answering her. Virtue and morality are being persecuted by such conduct. An afflicted person approacheth an assembly of good men, like one that is being consumed by fire. They that are in the assembly quench that fire and cool him by means of truth and morality. The afflicted person asketh the assembly about his rights, as sanctioned by morality. They that are in the assembly should, unmoved by interest and anger, answer the question. Ye kings, the Karna hath answered the question, according to his own knowledge and judgment. Ye should also answer it as ye think proper. Knowing the rules of morality, and having attended an assembly, he that doth not answer a query that is put, incurreth half the demerit that attacheth to a lie. He, on the other hand, who, knowing the rules of morality and having joined an assembly answereth falsely, assuredly incurreth the sin of a lie. The learned quote as an example in this connection the old history of Prahlada and the son of Anjuresa. There was of old a chief of the Daigyas of the name Prahlada. He had a son named Virakana. And Virakana, for the sake of obtaining a bride, quarreled with Sudhanwan, the son of Anjuresa. It hath been heard by us that they mutually wagered their lives, saying, I am superior, I am superior, for the sake of obtaining a bride. And after they had thus quarreled with each other, they both made Prahlada the arbitrator to decide between them. And they asked him, saying, Who amongst us is superior to the other? Answer this question. Speak not falsely. Frightened at this quarrel, Prahlada cast his eyes upon Sudhanwan. And sudden when in rage, burning like unto the mace of Yama, told him, If thou answerest falsely, or dost not answer at all, thy head will then be split into a hundred pieces by the wielder of the thunderbolt with that bolt of his, thus addressed by sudden when the Daitya, trembling like a leaf of the fig tree, went to Kasyapa of great energy, for taking counsel with him. And Prahlada said, Thou art, O illustrious and exalted one, fully conversant with the rules of morality that should guide both the gods and the Asuras and the Brahmanas as well. Here, however, is a situation of great difficulty in respect of duty. Tell me, I ask thee, what regions are obtainable by them who upon being asked a question, answer it not, or answer it falsely? 
Kasiapa thus asked answered, He that knoweth, but answereth not a question from temptation, anger, or fear, casteth upon himself a thousand nooses of Verona. And the person who, cited as a witness with respect to any matter of ocular or auricular knowledge, speaketh carelessly, casteth a thousand nooses of Verona upon his own person. On the completion of one full year, one such noose is loosened. Therefore, he that knoweth should speak the truth without concealment. If virtue, pierced by sin, repaireth to an assembly for aid, it is the duty of every body in the assembly to take off the dart, otherwise they themselves would be pierced with it. In an assembly where a truly censurable act is not rebuked, half the demerit of that act attacheth to the head of that assembly, a fourth to the person acting censurably, and a fourth unto those others that are there. In that assembly, on the other hand, when he that deserveth censure is rebuked, the head of the assembly becometh freed from all sins, and the other members also incur none. It is only the perpetrator himself of the act that becometh responsible for it. O Prahlada, they who answer falsely those that ask them about morality destroy the meritorious acts of their seven upper and seven lower generations. The grief of one who hath lost all his wealth, of one who hath lost a son, of one who is in debt, of one who is separated from his companions, of a woman who hath lost her husband, of one that hath lost his all in consequence of the king's demand, of a woman who is sterile, of one who hath been devoured by a tiger during his last struggles in the tiger's claws, of one who is a co-wife, and of one who hath been deprived of his property by false witnesses, have been said by the gods to be uniform in degree. These different sorts of grief are his who speaketh false. A person becometh a witness in consequence of his having seen, heard, and understood a thing. Therefore, a witness should always tell the truth. A truth-telling witness never lusseth his religious merits and earthly possessions also. Hearing these words of Kasiapa, Pralada told his son, Suddenwin is superior to thee, as indeed his father, and Jairus is superior to me. The mother also of Sudhanwan is superior to thy mother. Therefore, O Varakana, this Sudhanwan is now the lord of the life. At these words of Prahlada, Sudhanwan said, Since unmoved by affection for thy child, thou hast adhered to virtue, I command, let this son of thine live for a hundred years. The Dura continued, Let all the persons, therefore, present in this assembly hearing these high truths of morality, reflect upon what should be the answer to the question asked by Draupadi. Vaisampayana continued, The kings that were there hearing these words of Vidura answered not a word, yet Karna alone spoke unto Dasasana, telling him, Take away this serving woman Krishna into the inner apartments. And thereupon Dasasana began to drag before all the spectators the helpless and modest Draupadi, trembling and crying piteously unto the Pandavas her lords. Mahabharata, Book 2, Section 68 Draupadi said, Wait a little, thou worst of men, thou wicked-minded Dasasana. I have an act to perform a high duty that hath not been performed by me yet. Dragged forcibly by this wretch's strong arms, I was deprived of my senses. I salute these reverend seniors in this assembly of the Kurus. That I could not do this before cannot be my fault. Vaisampayana said, dragged with greater force than before, the afflicted and helpless Draupadi, undeserving of such treatment, falling down upon the ground, thus wept in that assembly of the Kurus. Alas, only once before, on the occasion of the Swayamvara, I was beheld by the assembled kings in the amphitheater, and never even once beheld afterwards. I am today brought before this assembly. She whom even the winds and the sun had seen never before in her palace is today before this assembly and exposed to the gaze of the crowd. Alas, she whom the sons of Pandu could not, while in her palace, suffer to be touched even by the wind, is today suffered by the Pandavas to be seized and dragged by this wretch. Alas, these Kauravas also suffer their daughter-in-law, so unworthy of such treatment, to be thus afflicted before them. It seemeth that the times are out of joint. What can be more distressing to me than that though high-born and chaste, I should yet be compelled to enter this public court? Where is that virtue for which these kings were noted? It hath been heard that the kings of ancient days never brought their wedded wives into the public court. Alas, that eternal usage hath disappeared from among the Kauravas. 
Else, how is it that the chaste wife of the Pandavas, the sister of Prashada's son, the friend of Vasudeva, is brought before this assembly? Ye Kauravas, I am the wedded wife of King Yudhisthira the Just, hailing from the same dynasty to which the king belonged. Tell me now if I am a serving maid or otherwise. I will cheerfully accept your answer. This mean wretch, this destroyer of the name of the Kurus, is afflicting me hard. Ye Kauravas, I cannot bear it any longer. Ye kings, I desire ye to answer whether ye regard me as one or unone. I will accept your verdict whatever it be. Hearing these words, Bhishma answered, I have already said, O blessed one, that the course of morality is subtle. Even the illustrious wise in this world fail to understand it always. What in this world a strong man calls morality is regarded as such by others, however otherwise it may really be, but what a weak man calls morality is scarcely regarded as such even if it be the highest morality. From the importance of the issue involved, from its intricacy and subtlety, I am unable to answer with certitude the question thou hast asked. However, it is certain that as all the Kurus have become the slaves of covetousness and folly, the destruction of this our race will happen on no distant date. O blessed one, the family into which thou hast been admitted as a daughter-in-law is such that those who are born in it, however much they might be afflicted by calamities, never deviate from the paths of virtue and morality. O princess of Panchala, this conduct of thine also, viz. That though sunk in distress, thou still easiest thy eyes on virtue and morality is assuredly worthy of thee. These persons, Drona and others, of mature years and conversant with morality, sit heads downwards like men that are dead, with bodies from which life hath departed. It seemeth to me, however, that Yudhisthira is an authority on this question. It behoveth him to declare whether thou art one or not one. Mahabharata, Book 2, Section 69 Vaisampayana said, The kings present in that assembly, from Tyr of Duryodhana, uttered not a word, good or ill, although they beheld Draupathi crying piteously in affliction like a female osprey, and repeatedly appealing to them. And the son of Dhritarashtra beholding those kings and sons and grandsons of kings all remaining silent, smiled a little, and addressing the daughter of the king of Panchala, said, O Yajnasini, the question thou hast put dependeth on thy husband's on Bhima of mighty strength, on Arjuna, on Nakula, on Sadeva. Let them answer thy question. O Panchali, let them for thy sake declare in the midst of these respectable men that Yudhisthira is not their lord, let them thereby make King Yudhisthira the just a liar. Thou shalt then be freed from the condition of slavery. Let the illustrious son of Dharma, always adhering to virtue, who is even like Indra, himself declare whether he is not thy lord. At his words, accept thou the Pandavas or ourselves without delay. Indeed, all the Kauravas present in this assembly are floating in the ocean of thy distress. Endued with magnanimity, they are unable to answer thy question, looking at thy unfortunate husbands. Vaisampayana continued, hearing these words of the Kuru king, all who were present in the assembly loudly applauded them. And shouting approvingly, they made signs unto one another by motions of their eyes and lips. And amongst some that were there, sounds of distress such as oh, and alas, were heard. And at these words of Duryodhana, so delightful, to his partisans, the Kauravas present in that assembly became exceedingly glad. And the kings, with faces turned sideways, looked upon Yudhisthira conversant with the rules of morality, curious to hear what he would say. And every one present in that assembly became curious to hear what Arjuna, the son of Pandu, never defeated in battle, and what Bhimasena, and what the twins also would say. And when that busy hum of many voices became still, Bhimasena, waving his strong and well-formed arms smeared with sandal paste, spake these words, If this high-souled king Yudhisthira the Just, who was our eldest brother, had not been our lord, we would never have forgiven the Kuru race for all this. He is the lord of all our religious and ascetic merits, the lord of even our lives. If he regardeth himself as one, we too have all been one. If this were not so, who is there amongst creatures touching the earth with their feet and mortal that would escape from me with his life after having touched those locks of the princess of Panchala? Behold these mighty, well-formed arms of mine, even like maces of iron. 
having once come within them, even he of a hundred sacrifices is incapable of effecting an escape. Bound by the ties of virtue and the reverence that is due to our eldest brother, and repeatedly urged by Arjuna to remain silent, I am not doing anything terrible. If, however, I am once commanded by King Yudhisthira the Just, I would slay these wretched sons of Dhritarashtra, making slaps do the work of swords, like a lion slaying a number of little animals. Vaisampayana continued, unto Bhima, who had spoken these words, Bhishma and Drona and Vidura said, Forbear, O Bhima. Everything is possible with thee. Mahabharata, Book 2, Section 70. Karna said, of all the persons in the assembly, three, viz, Bhishma, Vidura, and the preceptor of the Kurus, Drona, appear to be independent, for they always speak of their master as wicked, always censure him, and never wish for his prosperity. O excellent one, the slave, the son, and the wife are always dependent. They cannot earn wealth, for whatever they earn belongeth to their master. Thou art the wife of a slave incapable of possessing anything on his own account. Repair now to the inner apartments of King Dhritarashtra and serve the king's relatives. We direct that that is now thy proper business. And, O princess, all the sons of Dhritarashtra and not the sons of Pritha are now thy masters. O handsome one, select thou another husband now, one who will not make thee a slave by gambling. It is well known that women, especially that are slaves, are not censurable if they proceed with freedom in electing husbands. Therefore let it be done by thee. Nakula hath been won, as also by Messina, and Yudhisthira also, and Sadiva, and Arjuna. And, O Yajnasini, thou art now a slave. Thy husbands that are slaves cannot continue to be thy lords any longer. Alas, doth not the son of Pritha regards life, prowess and manhood is of no use that he offereth this daughter of Drupada, the king of Panchala, in the presence of all this assembly, as a stake at dice. Vaisampayana continued, hearing these words, the wrathful Bhima breathed hard, a very picture of woe. Obedient to the king and bound by the tie of virtue and duty, burning everything with his eyes inflamed by anger, he said, O king, I cannot be angry at these words of this son of Asuta, for we have truly entered the state of servitude. But, O king, could our enemies have said so unto me, if thou hadst not played staking this princess? Vaisampayana continued, hearing these words of Bhimasena King Duryodhana addressed Yudhisthira, who was silent and deprived of his senses, saying, O king, both Bhima and Arjuna, and the twins also, are under thy sway. Answer thou the question that hath been asked by the Rupadi. Say, whether thou regardest Krishna as unwon. And having spoken thus unto the son of Kunti, Duryodhana, desirous of encouraging the son of Radha and insulting Bhima, quickly uncovered his left thigh that was like unto the stem of a plantain tree or the trunk of an elephant and which was graced with every auspicious sign and endued with the strength of thunder and showed it to Drupadi in her very sight. And beholding this, Bhimasena expanding his red eyes, said unto Duryodhana in the midst of all those kings, and as if piercing them, with his dart-like words, Kama let not Vrakotara attain to the regions, obtained by his ancestors, if he doth not break that thigh of thine in the great conflict. And sparkles of fire began to be emitted from every organ of sense of Bhima filled with wrath, like those that come out of every crack and orifice in the body of a blazing tree. The doer then, addressing everybody, said, Ye kings of Pratipa's race, behold the great danger that Ari saith from Bimasena. Know ye for certain that this great calamity that threatens to overtake the Bharatas hath been sent by destiny itself. The sons of Dhritarashtra have, indeed, gambled disregarding every proper consideration. They are even now disputing in this assembly about a lady of the royal household. The prosperity of our kingdom is at an end. Alas, the Kauravas are even now engaged in sinful consultations. Ye Kauravas, take to your heart this high precept that I declare. If virtue is persecuted, the whole assembly becometh polluted. If Yudhisthira had staked her before he was himself one, he would certainly have been regarded as her master. If, however, a person stakes anything at a time when he himself is incapable of holding any wealth, to when it is very like obtaining wealth in a dream. Listening to the words of the king of Gandhara, fall ye not off from this undoubted truth. Duryodhana, hearing Vidura thus speak, said, I am willing to abide by the words of Bhima, 
of Arjuna and of the twins. Let them say that Yudhishthira is not their master. Yajnasini will then be freed from her state of bondage. Arjuna at this said, This illustrious son of Kunti, King Yudhishthira the Just, was certainly our master before he began to play. But having lost himself, let all the Kauravas judge whose master he could be after that. Vaisampayana continued, Just then, a jackal began to cry loudly in the home chamber of King Dhritarashtra's palace. And, O king, unto the jackal that howled so, the asses began to bray responsively. And terrible birds also, from all sides, began to answer with their cries. And Vidura conversant with everything and the daughter of Suvala, both understood the meaning of those terrible sounds. And Bhishma and Drona and the learned Gautama loudly cried, Swashti! Swashti! Then Gandhari and the learned Vidura, beholding that frightful omen, represented everything in great affliction unto the king. And the king, Dhritarashtra, thereupon said, Thou wicked-minded Duryodhana, thou wretch, destruction hath already overtaken thee when thou insultest in language such as this the wife of these bulls among the Kurus, especially their wedded wife Thropathi. And having spoken those words, the wise Dhritarashtra endued with knowledge, reflecting with the aid of his wisdom and desirous of saving his relatives and friends from destruction, began to console Krishna, the princess of Panchala, and addressing her, the monarch said, Ask of me any bone, O princess of Panchala, that thou desirest, chaste and devoted to virtue, thou art the first of all my daughters-in-law. Dhrupadhi said, O bull of the Bharata race, if thou wilt grant me a boon, I ask the handsome Yudhishthira, obedient to every duty, be freed from slavery. Let not unthinking children call my child India, endued with great energy of mind as the son of a slave. Having been a prince, so superior to all men, and nurtured by kings, it is not proper that he should be called the child of a slave. Dhritarashtra said unto her, O auspicious one, let it be as thou sayest. O excellent one, ask thou another boon, for I will give it. My heart inclineth to give thee a second boon. Thou dost not deserve only one boon. Dhrupadhi said, I ask, O king, that Bhimasena and Dhananjaya and the twins also, with their cars and bows, freed from bondage, regain their liberty. Dhritarashtra said, O blessed daughter, let it be as thou desirest. Ask thou a third boon, for thou hast not been sufficiently honored with two boons. Virtuous in thy behavior, thou art the foremost of all my daughters-in-law. Dhrupadhi said, O best of kings, O illustrious one, covetousness always bringeth about loss of virtue. I do not deserve a third boon. Therefore I dare not ask any. O king of kings, it hath been said that a Vaishya may ask one boon, a Kshatriya lady, two boons, a Kshatriya male, three, and a Brahmana, a hundred. O king, these my husbands freed from the wretched state of bondage will be able to achieve prosperity by their own virtuous acts. Footnotes 139 colon 1 A Word of Benediction, similar to Amen. Mahabharata, Book 2, Section 71 Karna said, We have never heard of such an act as this one of Rupadi, performed by any of the women noted in this world for their beauty. When the sons of both Pandu and Dhritarashtra were excited with wrath, this Dhrupadhi became unto the sons of Pandu as their salvation. Indeed the princess of Panchala, becoming as a boat unto the sons of Pandu who were sinking in a boatless ocean of distress, hath brought them in safety to the shore. Vaisampayana continued, hearing these words of Karna in the midst of the Kurus, viz., that the sons of Pandu were saved by their wife, the angry Bhimasena in great affliction said, Unto Arjuna, Kama o the Nanjaya, it hath been said by Devala three lights reside in every person, viz., offspring, acts, and learning, for from these three hath sprung creation. When life becometh extinct and the body becometh impure and is cast off by relatives, these three become of service to every person. But the light that is in us hath been dimmed by this act of insult to our wife. How, O Arjuna, can a son born from this insulted wife of ours prove serviceable to us? Arjuna replied, Superior persons, O Bharata, never prayed about the harsh words that may or may not be uttered by inferior men. Persons that have earned respect for themselves, even if they are able to retaliate, remember not the acts of hostility done by their enemies, but, on the other hand, treasure up only their good deeds. Bhima said, Shall I, O king, slay, 
Without loss of time all these foes assembled together, even here, or shall I destroy them, O Barada, by the roots, outside this palace? Or, what need is there of words or of command? I shall slay all these even now, and rule thou the whole earth, O king, without a rival. And saying this, Bima with his younger brothers, like a lion in the midst of a herd of inferior animals, repeatedly cast his angry glances around. But Arjuna, however, of white deeds, with appealing looks began to pacify his elder brother. And the mighty armed hero, endued with great prowess, began to burn with the fire of his wrath. And, O king, this fire began to issue out of Rakotara's ears and other senses with smoke and sparks and flames. And his face became terrible to behold in consequence of his furrowed brows like those of Yama himself at the time of the universal destruction. Then Yudhishthira forbade the mighty hero, embracing him with his arms and telling him be not so. Stay in silence and peace. And having pacified the mighty armed one with eyes red in wrath, the king approached his uncle Dhritarashtra with hands joined in entreaty. Mahabharata, Book 2, Section 72 Yudhishthira said, O king, thou art our master. Command us as to what we shall do. O Bharata, we desire to remain always in obedience to thee. Dhritarashtra replied, O Ajitasatru, blessed be thou. Go thou in peace and safety. Commanded by me, go, rule thy own kingdom with thy wealth. And, O child, take to heart this command of an old man, this wholesome advice that I give, and which is even a nutritive regimen. O Yudhishthira, O child, thou knowest the subtle path of morality. Possessed of great wisdom, thou art also humble, and thou waitest also upon the old. Where there is intelligence, there is forbearance. Therefore, O Bharata, follow thou counsels of peace. The axe falleth upon wood, not upon stone. Thou art open to advice, not Duryodhana. They are the best of men that remember not the acts of hostility of their foes, that behold only the merits, not the faults, of their enemies, and that never enter into hostilities themselves. They that are good remember only the good deeds of their foes, and not the hostile acts their foes might have done unto them. The good, besides, do good unto others without expectation of any good, in return. O Yudhishthira, it is only the worst of men that utter harsh words in quarreling, while they that are indifferent reply to such when spoken by others. But they that are good and wise never think of or recapitulate such harsh words, little caring whether these may or may not have been uttered by their foes. They that are good, having regard to the state of their own feelings, can understand the feelings of others, and therefore remember only the good deeds and not the acts of hostility of their foes. Thou hast acted even as good men of prepossessing countenance do, who transgress not the limits of virtue, wealth, pleasure, and salvation. O child, remember not the harsh words of Duryodhana. Look at thy mother Gondhari and myself also, if thou desirest to remember only what is good. O Bharata, look at me, who am thy father unto you, and am old and blind, and still alive. It was for seeing our friends and examining also the strength and weakness of my children that I had, from motives of policy, suffered this match at dice to proceed. O king, those amongst the Kurus that have thee for their ruler, and the intelligent Vidura conversant with every branch of learning for their counselor, have, indeed, nothing to grieve for. In thee is virtue, in Arjuna is patience, in Bhimasena is prowess, and the twins, those foremost of men, is pure reverence for superiors. Blessed be thou, O Ajitasatru. Return to Kandavaprastha, and let there be brotherly love between thee and thy cousins. Let thy heart also be ever fixed on virtue. Vaisampayana continued that foremost of the Bharata's king Yudhisthira the just then, thus addressed by his uncle, having gone through every ceremony of politeness, set out with his brothers for Kandavaprastha. And accompanied by the Upadhi and ascending their cars, which were all of the hue of the clouds, with cheerful hearts they all set out for that best of cities called Indraprastha. Mahabharata, Book 2, Section 73 Janamajaya said, How did the sons of Dhritarashtra feel when they came to know that the Pandavas had, with Dhritarashtra's leave, left Hastinapur with all their wealth and jewels? 
Vaisampayana said, O king, learning that the Pandavas had been commanded by the wise Dhritarashtra to return to their capital, Dasasana went without loss of time unto his brother. And, O bull of the Bharata race, having arrived before Duryodhana with his counselor, the prince, afflicted with grief, began to say, Ye mighty warriors, that which we had won after so much trouble, the old man, our father, hath thrown away. Know ye that he hath made over the whole of that wealth to the foes. At these words, Duryodhana and Karna and Sakuni, the son of Suvala, all of whom were guided by vanity, united together, and desirous of counteracting the sons of Pandu, approaching in haste saw privately the wise king Dhritarashtra the son of Vichitravirya, and spake unto him these pleasing and artful words. Duryodhana said, Hast thou not heard, O king, what the learned Verhaspati the preceptor of the celestials said in course of counseling Sakra about mortals and politics? Even these, O slayer of foes, were the words of Vrihaspati, those enemies that always do wrong by stratagem or force, should be slain by every means. If, therefore, with the wealth of the Pandavas, we gratify the kings of the earth and then fight with the sons of Pandu, what reverses can overtake us? When one hath placed on the neck and back of venomous snakes full of wrath for encompassing his destruction, is it possible for him to take them off? Equipped with weapon and seated on their cars, the angry sons of Pandu like wrathful and venomous snakes will assuredly annihilate us, O father. Even now Arjuna proceedeth, encased in mail and furnished with his couple of quivers, frequently taking up the Gandiva and breathing hard and casting angry glances around. It hath, also, been heard by us that Vrakotara, hastily ordering his car to be made ready and riding on it, is proceeding along, frequently whirling his heavy mace. Nakula also is going along, with the sword in his grasp and the semicircular shield in his hand. And Sadeva and the king, Yudhisthira, have made signs clearly testifying to their intentions. Having ascended their cars that are full of all kinds of arms, they are whipping their horses, for going to Kandava soon, and assembling their forces. Persecuted thus by us, they are incapable of forgiving us those injuries. Who is there among them that will forgive that insult to the Rupadi? Blessed be thou. We will again gamble with the son of Pandu for sending them to exile. O bull among men, we are competent to bring them thus under our sway. Dressed in skins, either we or they defeated at dice, shall repair to the woods for twelve years. The thirteenth year shall have to be spent in some inhabited country unrecognized, and, if recognized, an exile for another twelve years shall be the consequence. Either we or they shall live so. Let the play begin, casting the dice, let the sons of Pandu once more play. O bull of the Bharata race, O king, even this is our highest duty. This Sakuni knoweth well the whole science of dice. Even if they succeed in observing this vow for thirteen years, we shall be in the meantime firmly rooted in the kingdom and making alliances, assemble a vast invincible host and keep them content, so that we shall, O king, defeat the sons of Pandu if they reappear. Let this plan recommend itself to thee, O slayer of foes. Dhritarashtra said, Bring back the Pandavas then, indeed, even if they have gone a great way. Let them come at once again to cast dice. Vaisampayana continued, Then Drona, Somadatta, and Valhika, Gautama, Vidura, the son of Drona, and the mighty son of Dhritarashtra by his Vaishya wife, Burisravas, and Bhishma, and that mighty warrior Vikarna, all said, Let not the play commence. Let there be peace. But Dhritarashtra, partial to his sons, disregarding the counsels of all his wise friends and relatives, summoned the sons of Pandu. Mahabharata, Book 2, Section 74 Vaisampayana said, O monarch, it was then that the virtuous Gandhari, afflicted with grief on account of her affection for her sons, addressed King Dhritarashtra and said, When Duryodhana was born, the Dura of great intelligence had said, It is well to send this disgrace of the race to the other world. He cried repeatedly and dissonantly like a jackal. It is certain he will prove the destruction of our race. Take this to heart, O king of the Kurus. O Bharata, sink not for thy own fault, into an ocean of calamity. O Lord, accord not thy approbation to the counsels of the wicked ones of immature years. Be not thou the cause of the terrible destruction of this race. 
Who is there that will break an embankment which hath been completed, or rekindle a conflagration which hath been extinguished? O bull of the Barada race, who is there that will provoke the peaceful sons of Pretha? Thou rememberest, O Ajamata, everything, but still I will call thy attention to this. The scriptures can never control the wicked-minded for good or evil. And, O king, a person of immature understanding will never act as one of mature years. Let thy sons follow thee as their leader. Let them not be separated from thee forever by losing their lives. Therefore, at my word, O king, abandon this wretch of our race. Thou couldst not, O king, from parental affection, do it before. Know that the time hath come for the destruction of race through him. Err not, O king. Let thy mind, guided by counsels of peace, virtue, and true policy, be what it naturally is. That prosperity which is acquired by the aid of wicked acts is soon destroyed, while that which is won by mild means taketh root and descendeth from generation to generation. The king, thus addressed by Gondhari, who pointed out to him in such language the path of virtue, replied unto her, saying, If the destruction of our race is come, let it take place freely. I am ill able to prevent it. Let it be as they, these my sons, desire. Let the Pandavas return. And let my sons again gamble with the sons of Pandu. Mahabharata, Book 2, Section 75 Vaisampayana said, the royal messenger, agreeably to the commands of the intelligent king Dhritarashtra, coming upon Yudhishthira, the son of Pritha, who had by that time gone a great way, addressed the monarch and said, Even these are the words of thy father-like uncle, O Bharata, spoken unto thee, the assembly is ready. O son of Pandu, O king Yudhishthira, come and cast the dice. Yudhishthira said, Creatures obtain fruits good and ill according to the dispensation of the ordainer of the creation. Those fruits are inevitable whether I play or not. This is a summons to dice, it is, besides the command of the old king. Although I know that it will prove destructive to me, yet I cannot refuse. Vice Ampiana continued, although, a living, animal made of gold was an impossibility, yet Rama suffered himself to be tempted by a golden deer. Indeed, the minds of men over whom calamities hang became deranged and out of order. Yudhisthira, therefore, having said these words, retraced his steps along with his brothers. And knowing full well the deception practiced by Sakuni, the son of Pritha came back to sit at dice with him again. These mighty warriors again entered that assembly, afflicting the hearts of all their friends. And compelled by fate, they once more sat down at ease for gambling for the destruction of themselves. Sakuni then said, The old king hath given ye back all your wealth. That is well. But, O bull of the Barada race, listen to me, there is a stake of great value. Either defeated by ye at dice, dressed in deer skins, we shall enter the great forest and live there for twelve years, passing the whole of the thirteenth year in some inhabited region, unrecognized, and if recognized, return to an exile of another twelve years, or vanquished by us, dressed in deer skins, ye shall, with Krishna, live for twelve years in the woods, passing the whole of the thirteenth year, unrecognized, in some inhabited region. If recognized, an exile of another twelve years is to be the consequence. On the expiry of the thirteenth year, each is to have his kingdom surrendered by the other. O Yudhisthira, with this resolution, play with us, O Bharata, casting the dice. At these words, they that were in that assembly, raising up their arms, said in great anxiety of mind, and from the strength of their feelings these words, Alas, fie on the friends of Duryodhana that they do not apprise him of his great danger. Whether he, O bull among the Bharatas, Dhritarashtra, understandeth or not, of his own sense, it is thy duty to tell him plainly. Vaisampayana continued, King Yudhisthira, even hearing these various remarks, from shame and a sense of virtue again sat at dice. And though possessed of great intelligence and fully knowing the consequences, he again began to play, as if knowing that the destruction of the Kurus was at hand. And Yudhisthira said, How can, O Sukuni, a king like me, always observant of the uses of his own order, refuse, when summoned to dice? Therefore I play with thee. Sukuni answered, We have many kind and horses, and milch cows, and an infinite number of goats and sheep, and elephants and treasures and gold and slaves, both male and female. 
All these were staked by us before, but now let this be our one stake, viz., exile into the woods, being defeated either ye or we will dwell in the woods, for twelve years, and the thirteenth year, unrecognized, and some inhabited place. Ye bulls among men, with this determination, will we play. O Barada, this proposal about a stay in the woods was uttered but once. The son of Pritha, however, accepted it and Sukuni took up the dice. And casting them he said unto Yudhishthira, Lo, I have one. Mahabharata, Book 2, Section 76 Vaisampayana said, Then the vanquished sons of Pritha prepared for their exile into the woods. And they, one after another, in due order, casting off their royal robes, attired themselves in deerskins. And Dasasana, beholding those chastisers of foes, dressed in deerskins and deprived of their kingdom and ready to go into exile, exclaimed the absolute sovereignty of the illustrious king Duryodhana hath commenced. The sons of Pandu have been vanquished and plunged into great affliction. Now have we attained the goal either by broad or narrow paths. For today becoming superior to our foes in point of prosperity as also of duration of rule have we become praiseworthy of men. The sons of Pritha have all been plunged by us into everlasting hell. They have been deprived of happiness and kingdom for ever and ever. They who, proud of their wealth, laughed in derision at the son of Dhritarashtra, will now have to go into the woods, defeated and deprived by us of all their wealth. Let them now put off their variegated coats of mail, their resplendent robes of celestial make, and let them all attire themselves in deerskins according to the stake they had accepted of the son of Suvala. They who always used to boast that they had no equals in all the world will now know and regard themselves in this their calamity as grains of sesame without the kernel. Although in this dress of theirs the Pandavas seem like unto wise and powerful persons installed in a sacrifice, yet they look like persons not entitled to perform sacrifices wearing such a guise. The wise Yajnasena of the Somek race, having bestowed his daughter the princess of Panchalan, the sons of Pandu, acted most unfortunately for the husbands of Yajnasini, these sons of Pritha are his eunuchs. And O Yajnasini, what joy will be thine upon beholding in the woods these thy husbands dressed in skins and threadbare rags, deprived of their wealth and possessions? Elect thou a husband, whomsoever thou likest, from among all these present here. These Kurus assembled here are all forbearing and self-controlled, and possessed of great wealth. Elect thou one amongst these as thy lord, so that these great calamity may not drag thee to wretchedness. The sons of Pandu now are even like grains of sesame without the kernel, or like show animals encased in skins, or like grains of rice without the kernel. Why shouldst thou then longer wait upon the fallen sons of Pandu? Vain is the labor used upon pressing the sesame grain devoid of the kernel. Thus did Desasana, the son of Dhritarashtra, utter in the hearing of the Pandavas harsh words of the most cruel import. And hearing them, the unforbearing Bhima, in wrath suddenly approaching that prince like a Himalayan lion upon a jackal, loudly and chastisingly rebuked him in these words, Wicked-minded villain, ravest thou so in words that are uttered alone by the sinful? Boastest thou thus in the midst of the kings, advanced as thou art by the skill of the king of Gandhara? As thou piercest our hearts here with these thy arrowy words, so shall I pierce thy heart in battle, recalling all this to thy mind. And they also who from anger or covetousness are walking behind thee as thy protectors, them also shall I send to the abode of Yama with their descendants and relatives. Vaisampayana continued, unto Bhima dressed in deerskins and uttering these words of wrath without doing anything, for he could not deviate from the path of virtue, Dasasana abandoning all sense of shame, dancing around the Kurus, loudly said, O cow! O cow! Bhima at this once more said, Wretch darest thou, O Dasasana, use harsh words as these? Whom doth it behove to boast, thus having won wealth by foul means? I tell thee that if Rakotara, the son of Pritha, drinketh not thy lifeblood, piercing open thy breast in battle, let him not attain to regions of blessedness, I tell thee truly that by slaying the sons of Dhritarashtra in battle, before the very eyes of all the warriors, I shall pacify this wrath of mine soon enough. Vaisampayana continued, and as the Pandavas were going away from the assembly, the wicked king Duryodhana from excess of joy mimicked by his own steps the playful leonine trade of Bhima. 
Then Vercotera, half turning towards the king, said, Think not, ye fool, that by this thou gainest any ascendancy over me, slay thee shall I soon with all thy followers, and answer thee, recalling all this to thy mind. And beholding this insult offered to him, the mighty and proud Bhima, suppressing his rising rage and following the steps of Yudhisthira, also spake these words while going out of the Kaurava court, I will slay Duryodhana, and Dhananjaya will slay Karna, and Sudeva will slay Sakuni that gambler with dice. I also repeat in this assembly these proud words which the gods will assuredly make good, if ever we engage in battle with the Kurus, I will slay this wretched Duryodhana in battle with my mace, and prostrating him on the ground I will place my foot on his head. And as regards this, other, wicked person Desasana, who is audacious in speech, I will drink his blood like a lion. And Arjuna said, O Bhima, the resolutions of superior men are not known in words only. On the fourteenth year from this day, they shall see what happeneth. And Bhima again said, The earth shall drink the blood of Duryodhana, and Karna, and the wicked Sakuni, and Dasasana that mocketh the fourth. And Arjuna said, O Bhima, I will, as thou directest, slay in battle this Karna so malicious and jealous and harsh-speeched and vain. For doing what is agreeable to Bhima, Arjuna voweth that he will slay in battle with his arrows this Karna with all his followers. And I will send unto the regions of Yama also all those other kings that will from foolishness fight against me. The mountains of Himavat might be removed from where they are, the maker of the day lose his brightness, the moon his coldness, but this vow of mine will ever be cherished. And all this shall assuredly happen if on the fourteenth year from this, Duryodhana doth not, with proper respect, return us our kingdom. Vaisampayana continued, after Arjuna had said this, Sadeva the handsome son of Madri, endued with great energy, desirous of slaying Sakuni, waving his mighty arms and sighing like snake, exclaimed, With eyes red with anger thou disgrace of the Gandhara kings, those whom thou thinkest as defeated are not really so. Those are even sharp-pointed arrows from whose wounds thou hast run the risk in battle. I shall certainly accomplish all which Bhima hath said adverting to thee with all thy followers. If therefore thou hast anything to do, do it before that day cometh. I shall assuredly slay thee in battle with all thy followers soon enough, if thou, O son of Suvala, stayest in the light pursuant to the Kshatriya usage. Then, O monarch, hearing these words of Sadeva, Nakula the handsomest of men spake these words, I shall certainly send unto the abode of Yama all those wicked sons of Dhritarashtra, who desirous of death and impelled by fate, and moved also by the wish of doing what is agreeable to Duryodhana, have used harsh and insulting speeches towards this daughter Oyajnasena at the gambling match. Soon enough shall I, at the command of Yudhisthira and remembering the wrongs to Drupadi, make the earth destitute of the sons of Dhritarashtra. Vaisampayana continued, and those tigers among men, all endued with long arms, having thus pledged themselves to virtuous promises, approached King Dhritarashtra. Mahabharata, Book 2, Section 77 Yudhisthira said, I bid farewell unto all the Bharatas, unto my old grandsire, Bhishma, King Somadatta, the great King Valaka, Drona, Kripa, all the other kings, Aswathaman, Vidura, Dhritarashtra, all the sons of Dhritarashtra, Yayutsu, Sanjaya, and all the courtiers, I bid farewell, all of ye, and returning again I shall see you. Vaisampayana continued, overcome with shame none of those that were present there, could tell Yudhisthira anything. Within their hearts, however, they prayed for the welfare of that intelligent prince. The doer then said, The Reverend Pritha is a princess by birth. It behoveth her not to go into the woods. Delicate and old and ever known to happiness, the blessed one will live, respected by me, in my abode. Known this, ye sons of Pandu, and let safety be always yours. Vaisampayana continued, the Pandavas thereupon said, O sinless one, let it be as thou sayest. Thou art our uncle, and therefore like as our father. We also are all obedient to thee. Thou art, O learned one, our most respected superior. We should always obey what thou choosest to command. And, O high-souled one, order thou whatever else there is that remaineth to be done. The Dura replied, O Yudhisthira, O bull of the Bharata race, know this to be my opinion, that one that is vanquished by sinful means need not be pained by such defeat. 
Thou knowest every rule of morality. The Nanjaya is ever victorious in battle. Bhimasena is the slayer of foes. Nakula is the gatherer of wealth. Sadeva hath administrative talents. Daumya is the foremost of all conversant with the Vedas. And the well-behaved Dhrupathi is conversant with virtue and economy. Ye are attached to one another and feel delight at one another's sight and enemies cannot separate you from one another, and ye are contented. Therefore, who is there that will not envy ye? O Bharata, this patient abstraction from the possession of the world will be of great benefit to thee. No foe, even if he were equal to Sakura himself, will be able to stand it. Formerly thou wert instructed on the mountains of Himavad by Marusavarni, in the town of Varanavada by Krishna Dwepayana, on the cliff of Brigu by Rama, and on the banks of the Drishadwadi by Sambu himself. Thou hast also listened to the instruction of the great Rishi Asita on the hills of Anjana, and thou becamest a disciple of Brigu on the banks of the Kalmashi. Narada and this thy priest Daumil will now become thy instructors. In the matter of the next world, abandon not these excellent lessons thou hast obtained from the rishis. O son of Pandu, thou surpassest in intelligence even Puravas, the son of Isla, in strength, all other monarchs, and in virtue, even the rishis. Therefore, resolve thou earnestly to win victory, which belongeth to Indra, to control thy wrath, which belongeth to Yama, to give in charity, which belongeth to Kuvara, and to control all passions, which belongeth to Varana. And, O Bharata, obtain thou the power of gladdening from the moon, the power of sustaining all from water, forbearance from the earth, energy from the entire solar disk, strength from the winds, and affluence from the other elements. Welfare and immunity from ailment be thine, I hope to see thee return. And, O Yudhisthira, act properly and duly in all seasons, in those of distress and those of difficulty, indeed, in respect of everything, O son of Kunti, with our leave go hence. O Bharata, blessing be thine. No one can say that ye have done anything sinful before. We hope to see thee, therefore, return in safety and crowned with success. Vaisampayana continued, thus addressed by Vidura, Yudhisthira the son of Pandu, of prowess incapable of being baffled, saying, So be it, bowing low unto Bhishma and Drona, went away. Mahabharata, Book 2, Section 78 Vaisampayana said, Then when Rupathi was about to set out, she went unto the illustrious Pritha and solicited her leave. And she also asked leave of the other ladies of the household who had all been plunged into grief. And saluting and embracing every one of them as each deserved, she desired to go away. Then there arose within the inner apartments of the Pandavas a loud wail of woe. And Kunti, terribly afflicted upon beholding Rupathi on the eve of her journey, uttered these words in a voice choked with grief. O child, grieve not that this great calamity hath overtaken thee. Thou art well conversant with the duties of the female sex, and thy behavior and conduct also are as they should be. It behoveth me not, O thou of sweet smiles, to instruct thee as to thy duties towards thy lords. Thou art chaste and accomplished, and thy qualities have adorned the race of thy birth as also the race into which thou hast been admitted by marriage. Fortunate are the Kauravas that they have not been burnt by thy wrath. O child, safely go thou blessed by my prayers. Good women never suffer their hearts to the unstung at what is inevitable. Protected by virtue that is superior to everything, soon shalt thou obtain good fortune. While living in the woods, keep thy eye on my child, Sadeva. See that his heart sinketh not under this great calamity. Saying so be it, the princess Drupadhi bathed in tears, and clad in one piece of cloth, stained with blood, and with hair disheveled left her mother-in-law. And as she went away weeping and wailing, Pritha herself in grief followed her. She had not gone far when she saw her sons shorn of their ornaments and robes, their bodies clad in deerskins, and their heads down with shame. And she beheld them surrounded by rejoicing foes and pitted by friends. Endued with excess of parental affection, Kunti approached her sons in that state, and embracing them all, and in accents choked by woe, she said these words. Ye are virtuous and good-mannered, and adorned with all excellent qualities and respectful behavior. Ye are all high-minded, and engaged in the service of your superiors. And ye are also devoted to the gods and the performance of sacrifices. Why, then, hath this calamity overtaken you? 
Whence is this reverse of fortune? I do not see by whose wickedness this sin hath overtaken you. Alas, I have brought you forth. All this must be due to my ill fortune. It is for this that ye have been overtaken by this calamity, though ye all are endued with excellent virtues. In energy and prowess and strength and firmness and might, ye are not wanting. How shall ye now, losing your wealth and possessions, live poor in the pathless woods? If I had known before that ye were destined to live in the woods, I would not have on Pundit's death come from the mountains of Satisringa to Hastinapur. Fortunate was your father, as I now regard, for he truly reaped the fruit of his asceticism, and he was gifted with foresight, as he entertained the wish of ascending heaven, without having to feel any pain on account of his sons. Fortunate also was the virtuous Madri, as I regard her today, who had, it seems, a foreknowledge of what would happen and who on that account obtained the high path of emancipation and every blessing therewith. All, Madri looked upon me as her stay, and her mind and her affections were ever fixed on me. Oh, fie on my desire of life, owing to which suffer all this woe. Ye children, ye are all excellent and dear unto me. I have obtained you all too much suffering. I cannot leave you. Even I will go with you. Alas, O Krishna, Drupadi, why dost thou leave me so? Everything endued with life is sure to perish. Hath Dada, Brahma, himself forgotten to ordain my death? Perhaps it is so, and, therefore, life doth not quit me. O Krishna, O thou who dwellest in Dvarka, O younger brother of Sankarshana, where art thou? Why dost thou not deliver me and these best of men also from such woe? They say that thou who art without beginning and without end deliverest those that think of thee. Why doth this saying become untrue? These my sons are ever attached to virtue and nobility and good fame and prowess. They deserve not to suffer affliction. Oh, show them mercy. Alas, when there are such elders amongst our race as Bhishma and Drona and Kripa, all conversant with morality and the science of worldly concerns, how could such calamity at all come? O Pandu, O King, where art thou? Why sufferest thou quietly thy good children to be thus sent into exile, defeated at dice? O Sadeva, desist from going. Thou art my dearest child, dearer, O son of Madri, than my body itself. Forsake me not. It behoveth thee to have some kindness for me. Bound by the ties of virtue, let these thy brothers go. But then, earn thou that virtue which springeth from waiting upon me. Vice Ampayana continued, the Pandavas then consoled their weeping mother, and with hearts plunged in grief set out for the woods. And Vidura himself also much afflicted, consoling the distressed Kunti with reasons, and led her slowly to his house. And the ladies of Dhritarashtra's house, hearing everything as it happened, viz., the exile of the Pandavas, and the dragging of Krishna into the assembly where the princes had gambled, loudly wept censuring the Kauravas. And the ladies of the royal household also sat silent for a long time, covering their lotus-like faces with their fair hands. And King Dhritarashtra, also thinking of the dangers that threatened his sons, became a prey to anxiety and could not enjoy peace of mind. And anxiously meditating on everything, and with mind deprived of its equanimity through grief, he sent a messenger unto Vidura, saying, Let Kshada come to me without a moment's delay. At this summons, Vidura quickly came to Dhritarashtra's palace. And as soon as he came, the monarch asked him with great anxiety how the Pandavas had left Hastinapur. Mahabharata, Book 2, Section 79 Vaisampayana said, As soon as Vidura, endued with great foresight, came unto him King Dhritarashtra, the son of Amvika, timidly asked his brother, How doth Yudhishthira, the son of Dharma, proceed along? And how Arjuna? And how the twin sons of Madri? And how, O Kshada, doth Dalmya proceed along? And how the illustrious Thrupadi? I desire to hear everything, O Kshada, describe to me all their acts. Vidura replied, Yudhisthira, the son of Kunti, hath gone away covering his face with his cloth. And Bhima, O king, hath gone away looking at his own mighty arms. And Jishnu, Arjuna, hath gone away, following the king spreading sand grains around. And Sadiva, the son of Madri, hath gone away besmearing his face, and Nakula, the handsomest of men, O king, hath gone away, 
staining himself with dust and his heart in great affliction. And the large-eyed and beautiful Krishna hath gone away, covering her face with her disheveled hair following in the wake of the king, weeping and in tears. And O monarch, down me goeth along the road, with kusa grass in hand, and uttering the awful mantras of Samaveda that relate to Yama. Dhritarashtra asked, Tell me, O Vidura, why is it that the Pandavas are leaving Hastinapur in such varied guise? Vidura replied, Though persecuted by thy sons, and robbed of his kingdom, and wealth the mind of the wise king Yudhisthira, the just hath not yet deviated from the path of virtue. King Yudhisthira is always kind, O Bharata, to thy children. Though deprived of his kingdom and possessions, by foul means, filled with wrath as he is, he doth not open eyes. I should not burn the people by looking at them with angry eyes, thinking so, the royal son of Pandagoeth covering his face. Listen to me as I tell thee, O bull of the Bharata race, why Bhima goeth so? There is none equal to me in strength of arms, thinking so Bhima goeth repeatedly stretching forth his mighty arms. And, O king, proud of the strength of his arms, Vrakotara goeth, exhibiting them and desiring to do unto his enemies deeds worthy of those arms. And Arjuna the son of Kunti, capable of using both his arms, and wielding the Gandiva, followeth the footsteps of Yudhisthira, scattering sand grains emblematical of the arrows he would shower in battle. O Bharata, he indicateth that as the sand grains are scattered by him with ease, so will he rain arrows with perfect ease on the foe, in time of battle. And Sadeva goeth besmearing his lace, thinking none may recognize me in this day of trouble. And, O exalted one, Nakula goeth staining himself with dust thinking, lest otherwise I steal the hearts of the ladies that may look at me. And Dhrupathi goeth, attired in one piece of stained cloth, her hair disheveled, and weeping, signifying the wives of those for whom I have been reduced to such a plight, shall on the fourteenth year hence be deprived of husbands, sons, and relatives, and dear ones, and smeared all over with blood, with hair disheveled, and all in their feminine seasons enter Hastinapur, having offered oblations of water, unto the manes of those they will have lost. And O Bharata, the learned Daumya with passions under full control, holding the kusa grass in his hand and pointing the same towards the southwest, walketh before, singing the mantras of the Samaveda that relate to Yama. And, O monarch, that learned Brahmana goeth, also signifying, when the Bharatas shall be slain in battle, the priests of the Kurus will thus sing the Soma mantras for the benefit of the deceased. And the citizens, afflicted with great grief, are repeatedly crying out, Alas, alas, behold our masters are going away. O oh, fie on the Kuru elders that have acted like foolish children in thus banishing heirs of Pandu from covetousness alone. Alas, separated from the son of Pandu we all shall become masterless. What love can we bear to the wicked and avaricious Kurus? Thus, O oh king, have the sons of Kunti, endued with great energy of mind, gone away, indicating, by manner and signs, the resolutions that are in their hearts. And as those foremost of men had gone away from Hastinapur, flashes of lightning appeared in the sky though without clouds, and the earth itself began to tremble. And Rahu came to devour the sun, although it was not the day of conjunction, and meteors began to fall, keeping the city to their right. And jackals and vultures and ravens and other carnivorous beasts and birds began to shriek and cry aloud from the temples of the gods and the tops of sacred trees and walls and housetops. And these extraordinary calamitous portents, O king, were seen and heard, indicating the destruction of the Bharatas as the consequence of thy evil counsels. Vaisampayana continued, and, O monarch, while King Dhritarashtra and the wise Vidura were thus talking with each other, there appeared in that assembly of the Kauravas, and before the eyes of all, the best of the celestial rishis. And appealing before them all, he uttered these terrible words, On the fourteenth year hence, the Kauravas, in consequence of Duryodhana's fault, will all be destroyed by the might of Bhima and Arjuna. And having said this, that best of celestial rishis, adorned with surpassing Vedic grace, passing through the skies, disappeared from the scene. Then Duryodhana and Karna and Sakuni, the son of Suvala regarding Drona as their sole refuge, offered the kingdom to him. Drona then, addressing the envious and wrathful Duryodhana and Dasasana and Karna and all the Bharata, said, The Brahmanas have said that the Pandavas being of celestial origin are incapable of being slain. 
the sons of Dridarastra, however, having, with all the kings, heartily and with reverence sought my protection, I shall look after them to the best of my power. Destiny is supreme, I cannot abandon them. The sons of Pandu, defeated at Dice, are going into exile in pursuance of their promise. They will live in the woods for twelve years. Practicing the Brahmacharya mode of life for this period, they will return in anger and to our great grief take the amplest vengeance on their foes. I had formerly deprived Drupada of his kingdom in a friendly dispute. Robbed of his kingdom by me, O Bharata, the king performed a sacrifice for obtaining a son that should slay me. Aided by the ascetic power of Yaja and Upayaja, Drupada obtained from the sacrificial fire a son named Drishtadyamna and a daughter, Viz, the faultless Krishna, both risen from the sacrificial platform. That Drishtadyamna is the brother-in-law of the sons of Pandu by marriage and dear unto them. It is for him, therefore, that I have much fear. Of celestial origin and resplendent as the fire, he was born with bow, arrows, and encased in mail. I am a being that is mortal. Therefore it is for him that I have great fear. That slayer of all foes, the son of Prashada, hath taken the side of the Pandavas. I shall have to lose my life if he and I ever encounter each other in battle. What grief can be greater to me in this world than this, ye Kauravas that Drishtadyamna is the destined slayer of Drona this belief is general. That he hath been born for slaying me hath been heard by me and is widely known also in the world. For thy sake, O Duryodhana, that terrible season of destruction is almost come. Do without loss of time what may be beneficial unto thee. Think not that everything hath been accomplished by sending the Pandavas into exile. This thy happiness will last for but a moment, even as in winter the shadow of the top of the palm tree resteth for a short time at its base. Perform various kinds of sacrifices, and enjoy, and give O Bharata, everything thou likest. On the fourteenth year hence, a great calamity will overwhelm thee. Vaisampayana continued, hearing these words of Drona, Dhritarashtra said, O Kshata, the preceptor hath uttered what is true. Go thou and bring back the Pandavas. If they do not come back, let them go treated with respect and affection. Let those my sons go with weapons and cars and infantry and enjoying every other good thing. Mahabharata, Book 2, Section 80 Vaisampayana said, defeated at dice, after the Pandavas had gone to the woods, Dhritarashtra, O king, was overcome with anxiety. And while he was seated restless with anxiety and sighing in grief, Sanjaya approaching him said, O lord of the earth, having now obtained the whole earth with all its wealth and sent away the sons of Pandu into exile, why is it, O king, that thou grievest so? Dhritarashtra said, What have they not to grieve for who will have to encounter in battle those bulls among warriors the sons of Pandu fighting on great cars and aided by allies? Sanjaya said, O king, all this great hostility is inevitable on account of thy mistaken action, and this will assuredly bring about the wholesale destruction of the whole world. Forbidden by Bhishma, by Drona, and by Vidura, thy wicked-minded and shameless son Duryodhana sent his Suda messenger commanding him to bring into court the beloved and virtuous wife of the Pandavas. The gods first deprive that man of his reason unto whom they send defeat and disgrace. It is for this that such a person sees things in a strange light. When destruction is at hand, evil appeareth as good unto the understanding polluted by sin, and the man adhereth to it firmly. That which is improper appeareth as proper, and that which is proper appeareth as improper unto the man about to be overwhelmed by destruction, and evil and impropriety are what he liketh. The time that bringeth on destruction doth not come with upraised club and smash one's head. On the other hand, the peculiarity of such a time is that it mocketh a man behold evil and good and good and evil. The wretches have brought on themselves this terrible, wholesale, and horrible destruction by dragging the helpless princess of Panchala into the court. Who else than Duryodhana that false player of dice could bring into the assembly, with insults, the daughter of Drupada, endued with beauty and intelligence, and conversant with every rule of morality and duty, and sprung not from any woman's womb but from the sacred fire? The handsome Krishna, then in her season, attired in one piece of stained cloth, when brought into the court, cast her eyes upon the Pandavas. 
She beheld them, however, robbed of their wealth, of their kingdom, of even their attire, of their beauty, of every enjoyment, and plunged into a state of bondage. Bound by the tie of virtue, they were then unable to exert their prowess. And before all the assembled kings Duryodhana and Karna spake cruel and harsh words unto the distressed and enraged Krishna undeserving of such treatment. O monarch, all this appeareth to me as foreboding fearful consequences. Dhritarashtra said, O Sanjaya, the glances of the distressed daughter of Draupada might consume the whole earth. Can it be possible that even a single son of mine will live? The wives of the Bharatas, uniting with Gandhari upon beholding virtuous Krishna, the wedded wife of the Pandavas, endued with beauty and youth, dragged into the court, set up frightful wail. Even now, along with all my subjects, they weep every day. Enraged at the ill treatment of the Rupathi, the Brahmanas and Abadi did not perform that evening their Agnihotra ceremony. The winds blew mightily as they did at the time of the universal dissolution. There was a terrible thunderstorm also. Meteors fell from the sky, and Rahu by swallowing the sun unseasonably alarmed the people terribly. Our war chariots were suddenly ablaze, and all their flagstaffs fell down foreboding evil unto the Bharatas. Jackals began to cry frightfully from within the sacred fire chamber of Duryodhana, and asses from all directions began to bray in response. Then Bhishma and Drona and Kripa and Samadatta and the high-souled Valaka all left the assembly. It was then that at the advice of Vidura I addressed Krishna and said, I will grant thee bones, O Krishna, indeed, whatever thou wouldst ask. The princess of the Panchala there begged of me the liberation of the Pandavas. Out of my own motion I then set free the Pandavas, commanding them to return to their capital on their cars and with their bows and arrows. It was then that Vidura told me, even this will prove the destruction of the Bharata race, viz, this dragging of Krishna into the court. This daughter of the king of Panchala is the faultless Sri herself. Of celestial origin, she is the wedded wife of the Pandavas. The wrathful sons of Pandu will never forgive this insult offered unto her. Nor will the mighty bowmen of the Vrishni race, nor the mighty warriors amongst the Panchalas suffer this in silence. Supported by Vasudeva of unbaffled prowess, Arjuna will assuredly come back, surrounded by the Panchala host. And that mighty warrior amongst them, Bhimasena endued with surpassing strength, will also come back, whirling his mace like Yama himself with his club. These kings will scarcely be able to bear the force of Bhima's mace. Therefore, O king, not hostility but peace forever with the sons of Pandu is what seemeth to me to be the best. The sons of Pandu are always stronger than the Kurus. Thou knowest, O king, that the illustrious and mighty king Jarasandha was slain in battle by Bhima with his bare arms alone. Therefore, O bull of the Bharata race, it behoveth thee to make peace with the sons of Pandu. Without scruples of any kind, unite the two parties, O king. And if thou actest in this way, thou art sure to obtain good luck, O king. It was thus, O son of Gavalgani, that Vidura addressed me in words of both virtue and profit. And I did not accept this counsel, moved by affection for my son. End of Book 2, Savaparva Present you by HinduMonastery.com